Okay, so um, first thing I'm going to do is call, well, actually, who, who are all we have here? Do we have a quorum? One, two, three. Well, we have a quorum. That much is true. I'll give people another minute or so to get here. Is Jay missing? Jay and Donna. I saw Donna earlier. I saw her name up there anyway. Briefly. Oh, there's Jay. All right. Huh? All right, well, um, in that case, uh, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, I don't have any changes to propose. Does anyone else have any changes to propose? Um, yes, Bill. Yeah, we just have some confusion about the Conservation Commission appointments. I'm not sure whether it's the Conservation Commission or the Conservation Fund Board. So we'd like to suggest there's a Conservation Fund. Um, we've talked to the chair of the Conservation Commission and there's some confusion. Um, so we'd just like to request that we delay that until the next meeting so we can get that straightened out. That makes sense to me. Sounds good. Um, any others? Yes, Lauren. I just had a couple of questions about the um, wastewater treatment facility template contract at, that's on the consent agenda. So could we either pull it off or if I have a chance to just get a little clarification? Yeah, and we'll, we'll deal with that when we get to the consent agenda. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, any other proposed changes? Okay. Um, all right, so with that, without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. So on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, and if you have anything you'd like to say to the, to the council, to the public, um, you can say your name and where you live and try to keep your comments to about two minutes or less. Uh, that would be... Fabulous. Um, uh, is anyone interested in addressing the council? If you would like, you can unmute yourself and um, speak up, or you can raise a, a hand. And Cameron, are you seeing anyone? No, oh, ma'am. Okay. Okay, so I just want to make sure giving folks enough opportunity to jump in if they would like to, but it sounds like there is um, no one for general business and appearances, which is perfectly fine. Uh, so uh, we're going to move on to uh, a series of appointments. So we're going to postpone uh, the Conservation Commission appointment, uh, but we do have appointments to be made to the Public Art Commission, the Community Fund Board, uh, the Complete Streets Committee, and if any of those folks are here, it'd be great if you would uh, introduce yourself and tell us about the interest that you have in uh, serving on this board. So we're looking for um, Jody Brown, uh, Chris Kaufman, or Merrick Moden. Any of those folks with us? You know, we've got a number of people calling in, so I just wanted to check to make sure they're not one of those numbers. If you're calling in a phone, it's star six to unmute. Okay. All right, so um, in that case, um, 
Do we have a motion? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Pursuant to 1 DSA section 313A3, I move that we go into executive session to consider the appointment of a public official. Second. Okay, so a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, yeah, Madam Mayor, did you yes. want to consider each of these separately or all of them together? Like to, um, my hope would be that we would cons um, talk about them all together. And uh, Jack and uh, Dan, is that your understanding? If not, that's okay. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, all right, so uh, there's been a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Oh, was that a was that a hand, Kevin? Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, you seem to be muted. Okay, there we go. There you um, go. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Jody Brown, um, there was some confusion about getting her onto the agenda from last week. So I think Jody had intended to come, but she, I, I think there was some confusion she was on tonight or last last week. So, um, but she's okay. very interested in a public art commission. Great. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Any other comments? Okay, so... Um, uh, we've had a, a motion and a second. All in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so uh, we are going to go into executive session. This uh, meeting will remain open. Uh, we're going to disappear here for a little while, and uh, hopefully we'll be back soon. All right. We have executive session. So moved. <laughs> oh, Don, are you seconding? That was a second. That was a second. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so we're back in regular session. Uh, I'll make a motion uh, that we appoint Jody Brown to the Public Art Commission, uh, Christopher Kaufman to the Community Fund Board, and Merrick Moden to the Complete Streets Committee as a student member. I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. All right, um, thank you to all those who stepped up. We're so grateful for your work um, for the city. Uh, all right, so we are I think we're ready to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, and Lauren, um, do you want to pull an item? Yeah, could we please uh, pull off the item B, the waste hauler agreement for the phase one contract with the no. waste? No, one. just just we do have people here to sorry, just you. thank and and just to be clear, do you want to vote on that separately or um, did you just have questions about it? I have questions that it probably would be fine I just okay yeah that's all right well let's well let's deal with that um separately um so is there a that is item b of the consent agenda so is there a motion to oh uh, Donna go ahead I, I'm sorry I just have one small edit but I thought it was important enough to talk about in public that the new root my ride GMT is actually one word. And so in the November 18th minutes, they come across as two. It's capital M Y capital R I D E one word. So it's like a brand. It'd be help, helpful if all of us try to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Especially since that's going to be part of the website. Yeah. The name of the app. Um, okay, is there a motion to, oh, uh, Dan, go oh, ahead. Sorry, I was just going to make a motion to accept the consent, uh, uh, consent agenda minus uh, item B, the waste hauler contract. Second. And with, there's a motion and a second, and, and uh, presumably that incorporates Donna's edit? Yes. So, yes, okay, great. Uh, all right, any further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 
Okay. Aye. Aye. And opposed. Um, okay, so I think um, there it would be a, a question around um, whether or not to uh, take up item B now. And I guess my question is, Lauren, um, do you have a lo lots of questions or um, so you, yeah, what's your estimate there? Well, get, trying to get some clarity on particularly how this relates to the PFAS discussion we had a couple months ago. So okay. I don't think it will take long, but I guess it depends on the answers maybe. <laughs> well, um, uh, because we have other members of the public uh, waiting for now, let's uh, put that, um, I'd, I'd actually like to put that after uh, the CBHHH uh, presentation, uh, which I, I realize puts our staff on a little bit longer, but um, yeah, that's, that's how we're gonna roll right now. Um, okay, so um, John, um, you have an item on uh, town meeting day, legislative changes, go uh, ahead. Whoa, sorry, I'm so dark. Uh, just wanted to give you all an update and maybe ask for something and God, it's so dark, I don't mean to be so creepy looking. There. Um, so there was a meeting uh, in the last week that me and a couple other clerks were in with the uh, House and Senate uh, Government Operations Committee. Uh, Jim Condos and some of his staff were there. There's a represent representative from the governor's office. And everybody was talking about, you know, what are we going to do given that the COVID situation is still the COVID situation uh, on town meeting day for town meeting day elections. So uh, the idea was to put together a non-controversial bill that could basically fly through the committees and be on the governor's desk by the end of the first week of session, which would be a land speed record, but I think they're, uh, I think they're gonna do it. Um, now, there's a couple things that are gonna be in there, and I just wanna real quick tell you all what's in there and what I think, and then I guess ask for permission to be empowered to uh, make changes on the fly should they become necessary. Um, the big things are that uh, towns are going to be empowered if they so choose to do another all mail in election. Um, now, what that really means is that we, we don't have a choice because all it's gonna take is a few towns to do it and the expectation will be on all towns to do it. So, um, you know, good thing, bad thing, there's, there's, there's arguments to be made either way. Um, it's fine with me, but it does mean we're gonna need to do it. Um, then the other thing was an option uh, to actually change the town meeting election day. For this is in particular because the the problem with their turnaround, especially if you're talking an all male in election. I, can't, I keep wanting to say all male election. That's just all wrong. Um, would be to try to spread out that filing deadline because right now the filing deadlines, particularly for candidates would allow if we get the ballots printed, get them there, mail them out, you know, two weeks maybe for, for uh, voters to turn those around and get them counted. And the crunch for uh, town offices to actually do that and to count them and to get them in would be extremely high, especially given the fact that all mail-in elections boost turnout to the highest common denominator. Um, so instead of general election here, municipal election here, general election, municipal, they all go up to that general level. So we're all probably looking at record turnouts uh, for town meeting day for all of all of the towns that do uh, do the, the mail in. So um, what they're going to do is empower towns to make that decision. Now, obviously, with such a short time frame, any kind of decisions like that are going to have to be made on the fly and bringing together a meeting just might not be practical in order to give people warning. So I'm hoping that you all could empower me to work with whatever tools are given to me uh, by the state to make this happen. Having said that, honestly, um, it terrifies me a bit, but given that it's, it's likely, it wasn't promised, but it was largely assured that local municipalities are gonna have some money to cover this stuff from the governor. Again, not a promise, but apparently there is some discretionary money for that. Um, my inclination is just to bite the bullet, take a deep breath and charge forward 
with the current scenario, with the current filing deadlines. Just try to get everything out there as fast as we possibly can. I've already talked to a mail house about this. And then just to try to get them in by the standard town meeting day. Obviously, if we were to move it, there are a lot of financial considerations. There are also considerations that are being taken into consideration uh, by the, the legislature. And it, it, it will supposedly include um, uh, uh, allowances for towns to still have councils and select boards if they move that meeting. Because right now in the words of under the uh, terminology, the, the phrasing of our charter, only the mayor has a serves two years or until there's a new mayor in there. All the councilors have served two years. So they're, they're, they're going to craft it carefully so that, you know, were we to move that day, the council wouldn't evaporate except for the mayor if they're all by herself. Um, so that's being taken into consideration. The hopefully the change of the filing deadlines is also being wedged in there into consideration because right now those follow by a certain designated number of the election. So you move the election over here, you haven't saved yourself any time because they just follow you. So that's being taken into consideration too. But again, my inclination is just to stick with what we got and just, um, just dive in and pull that Band-Aid right off. I don't know if y'all have any questions. Uh, yeah, Donna and then Connor and then Dan. Okay, I'm sorry if you already said this, but I'm unclear of what is decided by the Secretary of State and what we as a council actually have to make a decision on. Okay. I know as far as um, petition for articles about funding, that's under our preview, but is there anything else that we really give you permission to do? Well, this will all come from the legislature. Um, right. So right now, they're also going to uh, allow, you know, candidates will not have to get signatures for their petitions. For a number of reasons, um, ballot petitions uh, will still have to get the signature requirement. So that probably means you're going to have a lot of folks, I mean, across the state, uh, councils and select boards are going to have a lot of folks uh, approaching them directly asking to have those things put on the ballot because um, it's going to be prohibitively difficult for them to get stuff on the ballot by petition. But, but now, you alluded to asking the council to give you permission to do something. Yeah, that was that was the next thing. Um, what um, I'm hoping the council will do is, you know, any changes that can be made to make them, if they make sense to be made, we would basically have to call a separate meeting and get together and vote on it. So what I'm hoping is the council would consider empowering me to make those decisions without having to have, you know, if, for example, we, there's another option in there that I don't know about that's going to show up, or we decide for some reason we can't have an all mail in election, or we decide we do need to change the town meeting day election date. Those are all decisions that the legislature is going to give us the freedom to enact but they could only be enacted, as I understand it, by a vote of the legislative council. So if there's, you know, we're talking matters of weeks. So if there's a decision that needs to be made to change a deadline, to change an approach that has to be made within a week, and we can't get together for a week, week and a half, what I'm just saying is that that's problematic. And it would be helpful if you all are agreeable, if you would consider passing a motion to empower me to make those decisions, obviously I can at least informally consult with everyone. Thank you. Um, Connor, go ahead. Don, is there any talk about making the um, signature requirements maybe electronic for the petitioning ballot items on? There is talk and it's um, it's too problematic for a number of reasons. Um, there's There's, electronic and there's electronic what format what vendor does email count um what's tested and what isn't um so that is unlikely to be on there go ahead, go ahead. Uh, what is uh you might not know the number off of your head 
Uh, how many signatures would folks need to get a budget ballot item on? A budget ballot item, about 600. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Sure. Um, going back to, I think, Donna's question, or at least your answer to it, John, um, I mean, would we have the authority to delegate to you some of these decisions? Um, you know, obviously, some of the deadlines, I, I don't know if we could necessarily vote in the abstract about it. Um, what precisely would you be looking for for authority from us? Just uh, authority to enact um, or to act on any statutory flexibility on the election process uh, granted by the legislature um, you know, for the town meeting day elections um, as, 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 a, as, as a COVID matter um, should they be deemed necessary. Right, but I mean, you as a city clerk have authority over the election. So if it's flexibility for you know how the election is run or conducted, um, you would obviously have that already. I, I and I apologize. I don't mean to be pedantic about this, and but I'm just wondering, just because it strikes me that if it's something like changing a deadline, or something where the legislature gives the legislative body of the council the power to change a requirement. Um, that would otherwise be there, and it gives it specifically to us as opposed to you. Um, I mean, is that something where y you would look to sort of act and then we would ratify um, afterwards and sort of with this um, sort of understanding that, you know, we give you sort of free reign to, to, to make some of those judgment calls? And it's, no, it's nothing. I mean, I, clearly, you know far more about running elections than just about everyone else on this call, and it's not the, a matter of not trusting the judgment. I'm just wondering uh, not to make it susceptible to any particular challenge or um, as far as sort of chain of authority goes, whether um, whether that would fly. Well, it depends on the wording. Last I heard, the wording was just going to be towns. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the rest is just, yeah, protection. Uh, I mean, I think somebody who you know had an issue or wanted to make a fuss if i just made a unilateral decision that was given to the towns you know um i would think it would be challengeable um you know maybe not or maybe we'd just be one of many that would be challenged um i would say though if it's something that i would just think that calling a special council meeting to discuss it and act on it would be problematic um, given we're talking about periods of you know if it gets passed the last that actually does get passed out the last week uh, or the last day of the first week in January and probably will be the next week we're looking at a couple weeks after that before petitions are going to be due um, another week after that before candidates are in and um, you know there's just not much time to work with but uh, sure. you know whatever whatever works for you all as I say my inclination is just to take a deep breath bite the bullet and try to run with it as we can although now that I mention that um, I probably would need the or would appreciate the authority or the blessing to uh, do an all mail in election because that would be a difference and then that would be something i would just be making a call on my own basically anything that i'm making a call on my own that's different than what's done every single year i would like the authority to do that because i don't necessarily feel that i have it okay i mean i i think there those are i mean there's a number of interesting things to sort of I think take one at a time. <laughs> it seems like, you know, as far as like deciding to do a mail-in election, I think that's a different question. And, and obviously, if we have an understanding of what this bill contains, as far as, you know, what, what are the potential issues, I, I, I'm certainly comfortable with like a mixture of, you know, um, both, you know, there may be something where we do need a special meeting, if there are certain things. Like I could see the all mail-in election 
you know, we don't have the money for it right now in the budget um, to pay for it as a city. But if if part of it is that the state will provide 50 or 75 or 85 percent of the cost, and and the, the remainder can be found, you know, that may be that may be something where a special meeting is is warranted to make that to make that decision. Um, and then some of the issues might just simply be ratification, you know, where no matter sort of to cover the authority question, um, if you make a decision um, and then we just ratify it, um, that takes care of that authority issue. Um, and I, I would see that being reasonable, especially in some of these judgment call where, you know, I, I don't know if I'm convinced that it's, I mean, usually that context of the election is you as the election official have the authority to do it and the statute says you know the city clerk shall oversee the election and so some of these things I would if they're not specific as to the city clerk or town clerk I, even if it's just to the town or city I, I still think you have the authority to do that as the primary election official on some of that administration well if you're feeling that the options are let me do it because I have the authority and don't worry about it or uh, give me the authority to do it, but uh, in the context of a special meeting and ratification, obviously I prefer to go with the former. <laughs> you just want to leave me with the power. I'm just telling you I'd be more comfortable with, uh, with authority, but on the other hand, I also don't want to create a process that is going to make it impossible to be nimble on this. And I think all of the towns right now that are talking about this are moving forward sort of borrowing against the idea that the governor's office is going to pay for 100%. So that's um, that's the hope. Okay. And that's what the governor's office, like I said, they, they didn't promise it, but that was very strongly put out there as, as likely. And the governor has, has come out and said that he wants towns to, to do all mail-in elections, so. Well, Jack. Uh, thanks. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of questions, as everyone has said. I'm, I'm looking at the calendar. Um, I think they're coming back on the 5th. Is that right? Mm, that sounds right. It's the Tuesday of the first week. Uh, yeah. And uh, and so conceivably, if, if something is passed and enacted by the 8th, we have a meeting on our calendar on the 13th, the following Wednesday. So... That's not a tremendous amount of, uh, of delay. Um, I'm, uh, so it may not be necessary to do what you're doing. I think I, I just, I, I'm a bit uncomfortable with Dan's suggestion that the city clerk has inherent authority because the way we'll find out if, uh, if Dan's right is or if we're all right if we go that way is somebody sues us uh, because they don't like the outcome of the election and uh, and a judge and then possibly even the vermont supreme court tell us what was the right or the wrong thing to do and i'd rather not be on the uh, the wrong side of, the, of that uh, yeah. judicial process um yeah. with so things like um, setting the date of the uh, town meeting and setting the uh, dates for filing uh, candidate statements or, or petitions, um, those seem to be relatively non-controversial, but I can imagine other things might be might be more controversial one of the things that i'd like some that i'm wondering about as you talk about an all mail in election um are you really suggesting that the election might be city hall is closed on town meeting day no no no, no, no. In? what we did in the general exactly oh, okay. the same and what's okay. done in oregon washington utah um colorado Okay, so that, that that's different, yeah, because I think that calling it an all-male election and saying nobody can show up in person and vote is worse than just saying 
we're going to provide an opportunity for everybody who wants to vote by mail to do so. Yeah, no, that would be unprecedented um, yeah. in, in the country. Um, I just mean, so we say an all mail out election. <laughs> yep. So, um, I, I would be more comfortable with, um, I think, unfortunately, the option of waiting until we see what passes and then acting at that point. And I, I realize that doesn't give us a lot of time. Maybe we, we do have some meeting at, at that following meeting in January. Um, and I, so I, I totally, I'm so glad that you are all for the all mail out uh, um, option. Uh, you know, it feels like we've learned something about elections. We get better turnout when this happens. We can't unlearn that. And so, yeah, we should, we should be doing this. Um, so I'm glad that, that, uh, that that's where you're at as well. Um, and I, and I, I would trust you to, you know, figure this all out. I just, I think as a matter of principle, don't like blank checks. Um, and so I, I think I'd, I'd rather wait and see because there may be other things that we have to consider that um, may come up and we might need to have a meeting anyway, um, even if we did give you this power. So I, I sort of consider this as like a, I mean, unless someone wants to make a motion right now, which is, that would be fine too. Uh, but otherwise I'd consider this like a fair warning that, you know, we, we might have to have a meeting um, in a hurry <laughs> um, to, to make the timing work out. Um, Lauren, go ahead. I'm just wondering from John, um, is there, I mean, is it helpful to get a sense of the council tonight or some kind of motion, like move forward, you know, as if, like, I assume there's preparation and work you would want to be doing to get ready for it. Like, is, is that helpful or is that just like, you'll just, presume that and do do what you're going to do. Um, I guess I just, if we're going to go the route well, and propose, just make sure we're not hamstringing you from work that, sh that should be done in the meantime. The only thing that would be a hamstringing, and it actually is important and significant, is I don't think I can make arrangements with a mail house and a printer and everything to pull off a mailing uh, to all of our registered voters, because it was the Secretary of State that did it before. This would have to come out of, of my office. And I think waiting until the 13th before knowing if I can pull the trigger on that would be very possibly prohibitively difficult. And I might be coming back to you then asking us to change the election day. I mean, like I said, just to, to make it possible, I've already had to start reaching out to printers and mailing houses. So um, that's, my, that's my only concern. If you all just explicitly wanted to give me the option to, you know, do an you know, a vote by mail election. Maybe that's more, maybe that's just one item you all be more comfortable with, but that's the only thing that worries me. More than, yeah. I mean, the it's other stuff. Us, John. If we get um, it all. I'm still working that out. Um, Do you have a range? I mean. Uh, 656,000. I'm going to guess about um, 8,000. 7, 8,000, something like that. That's not a guess. <laughs> I do have some information, but uh, that's that's what I'm that's what I'm thinking. And did you have a count as to how many of the mail ballots never showed up? You mean never came back? Yeah, never came back. weren't used. Well, let's see. Our turnout was um, was upwards of eighty percent. So I mean, I could do. Um, some quick math if you want me to pull up that program. What was it, about 56? So we probably had about 13, 1400 that didn't come back. Total, and that includes voting on election day, actually. And yeah, that was, was like my other question. Yeah, thank you. Election day, that's, yeah. that's helpful. OK, there were a few other hands that went up. Um, and still wanted. Yeah, Dan, go ahead. All right. Um, you know, I, I support the idea of mailing, uh, I mean, the um, mailing out the ballots in a similar fashion to what we did for the general election that we just did, because I think it does encourage uh, higher voter turnout and participation, which are good, good things. Um, I, I'm just 
I am concerned about the same thing the mayor expressed and, and really where my questions were going to, which is, you know, the idea of writing a blank check. If, you know, you're the presiding officer of the election by, by statute, and I think there are certain things you can, you can do um, in the administration of it that don't need our approval, but it, whether or not we, we will, you know, if you're looking to, for authority to sign like a contract with a mailing house to mail out these, which it sounds like kind of what you are um, at, at this point. Um, I, I think that's a, that's really a more of a money question than anything else is whether we would have, you know, because that's the risk we bear is that the state doesn't come together uh, for whatever reason uh, good, bad, or otherwise, and pass this, uh, pass this bill, um, and give us the authority, you know, give us the money to, to fund this local election, and we find ourselves on the hook for the, the cost of mailing these ballots out, um, which actually raises another question. John, is it your understanding that, um, if the legislature doesn't pass something for whatever reason, that you still have the authority, we would still have the authority as a town or as a city to um, to mail out ballots in the same manner that the Secretary of State did this fall? You know, I don't really know. That was something I know that we had talked about doing for the next year. So I figured that gave me a little time to <laughs> do a little research. Um, coming up so quickly like this, I don't know. I really don't. I think probably um my gut tells me there is nothing that would necessarily stop us from doing it it's not like changing the you know the the, the deadlines or the date or you know the rules for being open on election day it's nothing like that but honestly i i, I don't know and i think there's some fuzziness about that in general i th i think given that the legislature wants to specifically empower towns to do this or not that might be an indication right there that we don't have that authority otherwise why make it explicit um right right and whatever is not granted to the towns <laughs> is not is not given it's not as if we have liberal interpretation of our powers or inherent powers um that so i mean if if is there a way to sort of get ourselves into the queue of a mailing system? I mean, we're a sizable enough city that it, we could make essentially a reservation to do that contingent upon this funding. Um, I mean, I've talked to the, I have a, you know, a pretty good relationship going back a couple decades with a local mail house. Um, but um, I mean, I don't know, especially as such a job like that. They're probably going to have to, you know, really book some time and, and person power to make it work. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if just dropping in with two weeks before the mailing goes out and says and saying, can you guys do this, if they'll be able to do it, especially since it's going to be an unusual mailing. It's not going to be one you can just sort of stuff into standard machines. It's got the return envelope. We're not sure how long the, uh, the actual ballot is going to be, whether it's letter size or legal size. I'm hoping for letter size. Um, and so, you know, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I, um, voting is maybe one of the most important things that we do. And for ballpark $8,000, I, I think it'd be worth just authorizing you to uh, take that money from an assigned uh, general fund uh, money if, if we needed to. Uh, so, you know, could we, could we just, you know, say, uh, that, uh, you know, we're, we're granting you permission to, to do, you know, to, uh, to spend that money given that we have the authority to, to do it. I, Would that work for you? I don't know if we have the authority to do it though. Well, right, but no, that I guess that's what I mean. Like contingent on, um, on that, it, you know, that it's clear that we do. Would that would that be useful? You have the authority to authorize the money. You don't necessarily have the yeah. authority to take the election step right now. 
Well, but that's what I would want is right. uh, the blessing in a, in a formal form of the uh, council to go ahead and do that should it be something that we can do. So. Um, that, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Would it make sense just to like schedule a meeting for the 8th or the 9th of January, like right now? And if it's a ceremonial meeting, that's fine. But I know it's a weekend. None of us are going to the discotheque these days. Uh, could probably jump on and do it in a shorter period than this discussion's even taking place. It's, I, I think what he's saying is that he needs to start sooner than that. Is that correct, John? Yes. yes. Or if we want to right. have, if okay. we wait that long for everything, there's a decent chance I'm going to come back to you all and ask if we just don't just move the date. Um, it'll just depend on the feedback I get. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, we're still going to be in the midst of a pandemic. Like, I think giving whatever authority, uh, unclear from Bill's statement of, you know, exactly how we word it, but, you know, give our our blessing, our encouragement to the city clerk to move ahead with the steps necessary to be prepared to implement uh, all mail-out um, voting should the legislature approve it and um, allocate associated set aside associated funds, or I don't know if that kind of approach. Perfectly worded. I really think we're going to get the money for this, too. I mean, I really, really do. It sounded wild. Yeah, I mean, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Yes, that was, that was um, Donna, second. go ahead. Oh, Lauren, was that a motion? Uh, yes. OK, okay. and Donna has seconded it. Uh, uh, Dan. Sure, I mean, I guess it, I want to make sure that the motion is it's actually fairly careful on how, how we word it, because I think we're doing two things. And one is um, that um, we're, we're giving approval to a mail-in, uh, to, to mailing out ballots if, if we contingent upon clarification or granting of authority to do so. Um, and secondly, we're, we're authorizing the expenditure of up to $8,000 or approximately eight thousand dollars in funds to pursue to to essentially get the um, lock ourselves into a mailing house contract to make that possible under the existing timelines. If if that authority comes out, is that right? Is, and, is that accurate, Lauren? And is that uh, what? You, and is yeah. that what you need, John? Yeah, I mean, I don't know to what extent we're locked. I certainly, even with this mail house popped up with with plans that I've then yanked out from under them. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure what locking in necessary. Or make a reservation. I mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've done worse to contractors. Um, but. Okay. okay. All right, well, that that um, feels like that works for, uh, for me anyway. And it sounds like that might work for others. So um, there's been a motion in a second. Um, uh, any further discussion? Any comments from the public? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, all right, thank you, John. Um, and uh, looking forward to hearing the news as to what happens with all That's that. Be <laughs> exciting, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, all right. So we have um, the next up is uh, I think I'm trying to get over to Kevin Casey or um, representatives of uh, the, the Housing uh, Trust Fund. Absolutely. So tonight, um, I'm just going to kind of um, get through Paige it. Paige Gurton had her hand up. Paige Gurton was. Oh, thinking. oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Paige. A page, a page you are muted. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I got to the meeting about 10 minutes late and you'd already appointed people to boards and commissions. Um, and yes. I wondered if I missed appointments to the Conservation Commission. We tabled that. That is a great. We tabled that because of the con confusion about which board it was for. So after talking to you, we want to figure that out before, and it'll be on the next one. Okay. Meeting. All right. Oh, okay. All right. It was supposed to be the Conservation Fund Advisory Board was what they applied for. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, thank All you right. for that. Um, great. Okay, go ahead, uh, Kevin. Okay, so just to give you a little update, housing. Um, as you all know, it's been a crazy year for housing in the real estate market. Um, and we've seen uh, a really significant increase in the median uh, house price. Um, it's flowed, last data that I looked at, which was the end of September, was um, the median house price in Montpelier was 309,000. Um, yeah, that's the median. Uh, so the average is actually higher. Yeah. Um, and so that's a, that's about a $90,000 increase or, uh, 80, $79,000 increase, um, over the last two years. So the affordability crisis is, is coming in play. Um, you know, thankfully we, uh, the first time home buyers has actually been, um, fairly well utilized, um, it's, it's hard to gauge it on the fiscal year because of the, the home buying cycle. So I kind of look at it over, you know, uh, like, like an 18 month period and we've moved quite a few. Um, and some of the paybacks have come back, uh, about six or eight, I think it is. Let's pull it up. Um, we have four, seven, uh, seven new homeowners in town. Um, and you know, it's, it's encouraging that they were able to get in, but again, you know, it, it comes down to a, a function of supply. Um, and then, you know, on that front, um, you know, just as an aside, we're kind of flipping over to the accessory dwelling unit program. Um, that started out really strong. Uh, we've completed two of the seven that were approved by the community development block grant funding. Um, we've got two in the pipeline that are, uh, are pre-construction, so they'll be under construction shortly. Um, they're in the permitting phase and things like that. And then two that are in the pre-development phase. Um, that's an exciting program because it does create affordable housing at arguably the lowest amount of money than any other program. Um, and it doesn't tax our infrastructure. Um, so that's encouraging. The challenge with the program right now, um, I was hoping Tyler Moss from Vermont State Housing Authority could come tonight. Tyler um, had to be, uh, once COVID hit, he, he's taken over the um, rental assistance program for Vermont State Housing Authority. So uh, working with landlords and, um, and tenants and getting their rent paid. Um, so as you can imagine, you know, they're moving I forget what, don't quote me on this one, but I, as, as I recall, they were, they were moving uh, about a million dollars every two weeks in rental assistance um, and, you know, in the area. So it's, uh, so he's been pulled away to some degree. So some of the promotion part of it, um, but we plan on actually, you know, in the next building season, completing all seven of the ADUs that are in the grant requirement. Um, and then, you know, depending on the financial situation, there's going to be a, uh, a decision on how it's funded going forward and what the city's contribution might be to that. Um, but we're not there yet on making that decision because uh, we still have to get through the grant requirements for um, Vermont Community Development Program. But it's an exciting program and, and people um, have really embraced it. Uh, so that's, that's encouraging um, and we can, we would like the continued support from the council. Um, moving on to, um, what was the next one? Um, drawing a blank, sorry. Uh, first, time, first time home buyer, first time house, oh, the housing trust fund. Um, you also got a memo from, um, Polly and Jen uh, um, regarding, you know, funding of the housing trust fund. Um, you know, the, the goal was by 2025 that we would have $200,000 in reserves for upcoming projects. Um, and that is actually, that's actually, um, uh, it, it's, it's likely gonna be, be needed by 2025. Um, 
And I think the concern is, is that, you know, by not funding the housing trust fund at all is that it will be, you know, it'll be forgotten. Um, and so the housing task force request is for 55,000, um, which is, is it 55,000? I thought it was just 50. 50. But, oh, it was yeah. 50,000, 55% less than last year. Sorry. Right. right. That's okay. Um, and so that's just an item to consider too. Uh, you know, we, we are heading into a period where we don't know exactly where um, funds will be needed. We have some projects, um, some larger housing projects in the works um, that that may or may not need, uh, you know, some some help. We we don't know just yet. Um, it's some of the stuff is in pre-development stages. So, um, but there are exciting things happening. So um, just be on the lookout for that. Uh, and um, um, you know, the other issue that that is coming up too is that will that will be coming down um, is. Uh, regarding homelessness. Um, Good Samaritan House has been looking for a new facility and uh, are in the um, are in the the you know the kind of site uh, selection stages. And you know I think that that there may be a request coming to the housing trust fund to help with with that project um, wherever it lies. You know that one's going to be a little bit different because it won't be located well, it's not say it's not going to be located, but it may not be located right in Montpelier. Um, but the service need is certainly, um, you know, uh, affects Montpelier and the, our homeless population. So it's something to kind of keep on the radar. Uh, we, we will know more in the next few months as that, as that works forward. Um, and, um, Let's see. So that's a, that's about what I have at this point, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, you know, it's been a it's been an interesting year for housing. Yeah, agreed, and uh, not exactly expected. No, and to be honest with you, you know, on multiple levels, the um, the 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 market, the sales market was actually really surprising to a lot of people. Um, it yeah. was expected to be dead and it, and it was, um, it, it, yeah. It, yeah, our, um, inventory, our housing inventory right now is 1.8 months. And I think it is, as you, you recall of 1.8 and as you recall, a, a healthy housing market is over six months. Um, and you know we've always been under six for the last five years, but 1.8 is the lowest it's ever been. So, wow. inventory is going to be a huge issue, and hopefully we can change that with some upcoming projects. Yeah, and I see a hand from uh, Peter Kelman. Peter, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Kevin. I, I have a question about the ADU program. I talked to Tyler. Uh, quite a bit over the last couple of years about uh, yeah. since, since it started. And um, I've gathered that one of the obstacles is that um, in some cases, or most cases, the, uh, the prospective uh, builders or homeowners need to spend the money first and then get reimbursed. Um, and one of the difficulties <laughs> is that there are a lot of upfront expenses. Yeah. Um, uh, and some of the upfront expenses are expenses with the town, the cost of um, uh, the various building fee fees and so forth. And then also expenses of having an architect and you know me being able to jump over a lot of hoops. Yeah, and I'm wondering what, if anything, can the town do to try to, is, for example, could you put off uh, 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 collecting fees until the end of the project, or at least 
collect a, a, a fraction of them to help to, 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 to facilitate uh, people who don't have the means necessarily to to front the, um, the, the those expenses. Yeah, there's um, we've had a number of discussions, and, and, and at the end of this project, we will do a report on on you know where we can. <clears throat> Um, you know, this is a pilot program, so we're we're working out the kinks. One of the kind of challenges with this is that the funding source that we use, um, which is community development block grant funds, are federal funds, and so it's not an ideal source um, for housing because and and I think that actually that's one of the issues that I think is is uh, is conflated between um, state and local, the or state and federal versus local. Our local fees are, are pretty standard. That's, you know, um, um, access fees for sewer, sewer and water um, and permit fees. Um, and that may be something that we, we recommend is that like the pre-development costs uh, can be, um, you know, borne by the program. Um, I think the challenge is, is that, you know, if you have if you have the program pay all of the pre-development costs, you run into a situation where the homeowner doesn't have skin in the game. And if the project doesn't move forward, what is your recourse for recovering the funds that you spent for someone to decide that they weren't gonna do it? Um, and I think that the post-program report will look at those issues and then make a recommendation. I don't think we're there yet. We've only completed two of them. We've got two. I know, but, th but that's actually my point. You may not have gotten as much action on these as you might have. I, I, I know for a fact people who said, I just can't spend the money up front to do that. I think it's a great idea, but I can't do it. And, and, and while you might say that the, the, the fees are standard, they are still too much. Skin in the game is fine if you've got a lot of skin. But if we really want to uh, have a program that's going to allow, let's say a senior who's got a big old house and is really, you know, wants to duplex it uh, under under this program or, you know, something you know close to a duplex, and they just can't afford to put that money up front. I, I, I understand where you're coming from too. So, but like I, I also would would argue too is that the that you might have a senior who has the great big house with a tremendous amount of equity, and when you're looking at interest rates as low as they are, it is basically free money when you take the cost of inflation. So it it is it is you may have to take borrow money to make money. That's just a part of. Um, that, that's just a part of, of being a landlord. And there is a part of it too, which is that we want to ensure that the landlords are, that people who are going to be landlords are prepared for ongoing costs. We don't want to run into a situation where we put in ADUs where the person is completely underfunded and a furnace breaks and they don't have the ability to fix it. And now we've got not only a homeowner, but a tenant who are cold in the middle of January. There, there is a part of this, which is, this is not a program for everyone. This is a program for people who want to do it, who understand that there will be, it will cost money, but that we are, by funding this, we are funding affordable housing because we're ensuring that those units are affordable. And so, you know, if somebody just wants to be, rent a unit at market rate, more power to them. They can and we would still encourage that. But if they're using this these program funds, then you know we, we have to we just have to make it work within those parameters. And and like I said, Peter, there some of those critiques may be addressed in the pro, post program report. This is still a pilot, so these things are being worked out as we go. Um, well, I, I I certainly hope they'll be addressed in in the post. Uh, program uh, report, but I also think that the program, frankly, up to this point, I, I think seven possible is not a great record. You really only have two that are 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 are, are really so. Going. Put it into perspective, so, I think, Peter. I think with a little more 
coaching and put it in a so so um i'm gonna interrupt you both um and, and say um so usually we don't we don't do uh, like back and forths um so the idea would be if you um you know have suggestions and critiques awesome um and uh and then um you know having a, a response that that works um peter if there's other thoughts and ideas you have um uh i'd i'd give you uh sort of one uh, opportunity to say like uh if you have any final final thoughts peter go ahead and then i'm gonna let kevin you go ahead and and then uh and i'm gonna give some other folks a chance to speak uh, kevin or, or um uh peter you're you're uh looks like you're you're declining to say anything further is that correct okay um, uh, Mr. Kelman, can I get you to state uh, your address or your district for us for the record? Uh, 6 Mountain View Street, District 3. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay, other thoughts or comments uh, from council or the public? And Cameron, are you seeing anyone? No, ma'am. Okay, well, I, uh, I'm i very grateful for this update. I mean, it sounds like um, there is a, a huge need for affordability in Montpelier. And just so I, I'm clear, I just wanna make sure I have uh, the, the data that you quoted correct. Um, so the median house value right now is $309,000. Is that is that accurate? Oh, I think you gotta, yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, the the median sale price uh in uh at the end of september was three hundred nine thousand. okay yeah um and that's up seventy thousand dollars over the last two years yeah okay and just but, wanted to add yeah. one one thing about housing growth um yep you know when we when we talk about low numbers like you know two or three in a in a year um, it's also putting into the perspective is that, you know, when we look at projects like um, the French block, that took, you know, 10 years for 18 units. Yeah. Taylor Street took a, a fair amount of time for 30 units. So when you average it out, when you're doing three units a year um, for one program, that doesn't include market rate or anything else, is that you're making progress. Um, it's not it's not huge but it's incremental and that that's where we're going to get that's how we're going to get the housing stock we we need is incrementally with the big projects thank you thank you sure. um i'll just uh uh say for myself you know in uh, in regards to the amount of money that the housing uh task force um Actually, to be fair, I think we should probably have the conversation about the, the money for the housing task force. We should have that together in the budget conversation. Um, I, I think that's probably where that belongs, like it, having that conversation together with, um, with all the other um, elements that are at play. Um, but uh, thank you for that update. Sure. Any other questions, comments? Okay. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. And uh, I think we're, um, so we're, we're gonna be talking ab about that funding uh, in a little bit here, uh, but moving on uh, to the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. Uh, I know I um, saw a couple representatives from that group here. Um, wonderful, um, Shana and Jeremy, um, I know you're both on the, the committee, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I know, uh, I think I saw Michael Sherman as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll turn it over to you to tell us about this. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. I'll just start off by just sharing, reminding the, the council and, and attendants about the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee um, before handing it over to Jeremy to share more about our tool. Um, so my name is Shana Casper. I live on Kent Street, um, and I'm the chair of Montpelier Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, which was formed a few years ago by the City Council, recognizing the historical and ongoing systems and structures of uh, racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, ableism, and other forms of injustice and oppression. And so we were formed to assist the council 
in addressing and reshaping these systems and policies and practices that perpetuate these barriers to social, economic, and racial justice in our community. And so while so the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee, CJAC, uh, does not have any organizational opinions about the proposed fundings and funding cuts to community service related groups, um, we have developed this tool um, that I believe was sent to you guys two weeks ago um, to address equity issues during these really difficult deliberations. Um, so I'll hand it over to Jeremy to walk through the tool. Great, thanks Shana. Um, and good evening everyone, happy to be here. Um, so what I'll, I want to do just very briefly is um, to kind of give you an overview of the tool um, as well as some recommendations of how we imagine it could be used by you. Um, and also end with an example that um, another committee member and I ran through um, just by way of showing you how it could work um, in your deliberations. Um, I think the, you know, Shana spoke well about the role of CJAC as a committee. Um, and I think it, it came to our attention a few, a few weeks ago now that there was a deficit um, in the budget coming into fiscal year 2022. Um, and I think we, we thought there was perhaps a role for us to play in terms of um, you know, addressing that deficit through the lens of, of equity that is the charge of, of the committee. Um, so as we were thinking about what we might contribute, um, I, I think you know one of the principles we began to discuss is how can we make more tangible, more readily accessible um, this principle of, of building equity into the budgeting process um, as a way to kind of bring forth the values that the city council has already kind of em, em embraced um, and established in their strategic goals. Um, so I'm. I believe you all have seen our letter and the tool that we presented. It's very straightforward, it's very simple. Um, and just to remind you all, um, it's basically built upon three strategic questions. Um, and I wish I could say that we um, drafted those questions out of thin air, but we did a lot of research and someone else said formulate those questions and they seemed really right on. Um, and so we borrowed them from um, some other materials that we had researched. Um, I saw someone raise their hand. Did you have a, a quick question? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, thank you. I was thinking that uh, the members of the council have seen this, but there are probably people uh, watching the meeting who have not. And so uh, if the speaker could be allowed to share his screen so everyone can see it, that might be helpful. I, I do have it up. I could do that. You should have the ability to go ahead and do that, Jeremy. Okay, here I go. Okay. Can everyone see this? I think so. Okay. Um, yes. So um, it's basically it's a one sheet, two sides of a single sheet of paper. Um, and again, those those strategic questions that we've kind of focused this tool around. Uh, I'll just read them here if you can't quite see them. Um, the first question: What are the social, economic and racial justice impacts of this budget decision on a marginalized population in our community. The second question, who will benefit from or be burdened by this particular budget decision? Uh, and the third question, what strategies are there to mitigate any unintended consequences of this budget decision? And if no strategies exist, how will you create them? Um, and so we understand that this comes to you kind of late in the game. Um, I think we, imagine a, a longer term game, um, scenario here in which perhaps this kind of a, an equity assessment is filtered down to you know, city staff and their various departments and budgets are built with these principles in mind from the ground up. Um, however, where we are now is you have to make some difficult decisions around the budget. Um, and we wanted to offer this as a way to, um, you know, keep values kind of for you as you have these questions um, and make them um, kind of more transparent. Um, so some recommendations for how you might use this tool. Um, you know, it's, there's an attached worksheet here that I'll show you. Um, and this worksheet is a way to break down any 
significant budget topic or item that's up for dis discussion. Um, and to first here on the left hand side is to specify what stakeholder groups might be impacted by this particular budget decision. Um, and again, we're focused here on, you know, marginalized and underrepresented groups in uh, our community. Um, so it could be that you're um, thinking about um, BIPOC, BIPOC folks in the community, or you want to pick um, a look at um, people with disabilities in particular. Um, we have a list of examples um, down below. Um, the, the next thing you start to ask is those strategic questions going kind of row by row with each of those various stakeholder groups. Um, so looking for the potential positive impacts that this budget decision might have, um, looking at the potential negative impacts that this budget decision might have, um, and then thinking about well, what is the strategy for mitigating any unintended consequences. Um, so um, I think if it's all right, what I'm going to do now is just kind of run through an example um, of how you might use this tool. So I'm going to actually have to share a different window here. Um, and I will bring that up. Oops. Okay. Um, and it, it kind of somewhat coincidentally, and um, Kevin, Casey, and I did not speak or know each other before this, but the example that we chose um, in kind of doing a practice run of the tool was um, the housing trust fund line item. Um, which, you know, is a substantial um, cut to a, a fairly large um, budget amount. Um, so, you know, I'll just do this very quickly. And this is, this is your work to do. This isn't our work to do as a, a committee. We just offer it as an example of how you might use the tool. Um, so for, for the purposes of the, the housing trust fund, who are some impacted stakeholder groups? Well, certainly people with no or low income uh, would be impacted by this particular budget cut. Um, are there any potential positive impacts? Well, you would think probably not. Um, one possible potential positive impact here might be that the property tax rate um, stays flat or decreases because of a reduced budget amount, um, and that could perhaps stabilize rent or housing costs. Um, but move over to what are the negative potential negative impacts? Um, well, clearly, perhaps less availability of affordable housing in Montpelier. Um, some people in that no or low income bracket may be pushed into homelessness, um, therefore being pushed into unsafe or unhealthy living conditions. Um, and then what is the strategy for mitigating unintended consequences? Um, well, perhaps we could fund uh, other local organizations that provide services for, for folks um, in the low and no income bracket um, that would kind of offset some of the potential harms of a decrease in affordable housing. Um, so I'm not going to go through every row here, um, but I hope you kind of get the sense of how this worksheet might give you something a little bit more structured in terms of the conversation around looking at potential positive negative impacts and who is, who is impacted. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to ask if Shana or Michael have any other thing that I missed, I'm seeing now. Um, and I think, you know, at this point, I'd uh, love to hear any questions or feedback that you have on this. I just want to start off by saying um, thank you so much for sharing this with us. I, I'm actually particularly glad that you were able to run through an example with this because I, I was having sort of a hard time picturing like that last column, like so what you know, um, just so having a, an example to help anchor that for me was really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, Welcome. Yeah, other thoughts or comments? Connor, go ahead. No worries if you guys haven't considered this at all, so don't feel the need to answer, but the really like big question I ask myself, like a lot of the time, is, okay, uh, we're in a bit of economic downturn here, and, you know, like one person might say, we should raise taxes, right? 
because there's a lot of people struggling right now and you know people can afford it we should chip in a little bit to bring them up the other school of thought is okay if we raise taxes it's a very blunt instrument we have to do it in montpelier right it's not very progressive it's all property tax pretty much mm -hmm. um in addition to like some of the use tax but um has the committee given any thought to like okay if you raise taxes uh ashley hill i'll pull her out as an example we're always saying council, I don't want to raise taxes because you know what? The landlords are going to have to pay a bit more and that's going to trickle right down to the renters. who are going to have to pay more as well. And they're the last people who can afford it. So I, I don't know if the committee's sort of sussed over this question a bit uh, because it's kind of like limited what we can do on council. And we, we you know, we might consider a charter change at some point, but uh, yeah, I, I'd love your thoughts on it if you had any. Well, it hasn't, it hasn't been a discussion item for us in terms of um, specific actions or policies that might um, change the revenue side of the equation. Um, so I, I appreciate your question. I don't think we have much to say on that matter, um, but it does trigger something for me, which is, um, you know, there are some, some items in the proposed budget that have been zeroed out, which I think are left to council to kind of um, debate and determine how maybe to meet those gaps or, or to, to fund. But I would also recommend that this tool could be applied to things in the budget that perhaps have level funding or um, slightly decreased funding. Um, you know, I think the, the long-term goal here is a budget that is built with equity in mind throughout its entirety. Um, so I, I don't know about um, I have nothing to say about like, how do you increase revenue? Um, but the tool itself could be used to shift priorities in the budget that exists as it's been proposed. Um, Shana, it looks like you have something to say, I think. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that we as a committee, you know, do not have kind of committee uh, opinions about what should be, um, you know, increased funding or, or decreased funding or how to, how to raise those funds. Um, so I just wanted to echo, <laughs> say that again. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just to, to go off of what Jeremy was saying, in, in doing the research on this, also finding out about other cities that have uh, equity, you know, come uh, as the very core of how they're approaching their budget. And this, this really opened our eyes to, you know, in the future, um, when building the budget, having, having city staff potentially, you know, use a tool like this and the very beginnings of coming up with the, with the budget um, and being able to um, ask, ask these questions um, and, you know, have some, you know, more public discussion about what is being included in the budget and what is um, given what level of funding to what ends um, for, for the community. Um, so this was kind of our first foray into this and would love to continue this conversation in the future. Great, thank you. Uh, Dan, go ahead, sure. and then Lauren. I'll, I'll echo the thanks for uh, for drafting this document and bringing it before us. I think I think it is helpful. I guess I, um, one thing that that strikes me on the idea of unintended consequences, I don't know if they're necessarily unintended. They strike me more as collateral consequences. Um, you know, because, I, and I think it's really helpful to think about that because, you know, that's something I think we always try and do informally, but, but this document kind of makes it a formal thing, which is if you cut one thing, what are the collateral consequences of that cut? I mean, you know, when we're doing these budgets, our main goal is to make sure we build a budget that, that funds our you know, things that we've, uh, priorities and things that we've done before, paving the streets and such in a manner that's consistent with an affordable tax rate, you know, as, as Connor alluded to. But, you know, when we have to do years like this, where we're having to make hard decisions, I think this is a really good tool for us to be thinking through what are the collateral consequences. Um, and I guess I just suggest as you start to revise that, that, that might be better phrasing of it because it's often hard to say what are the un unintended consequences until they're actually on your plate. But I think the thinking about collateral consequences, you know, who picks up the slack if we stop doing X um, or if we do, if we fund X to a lesser extent, um, 
I think those are really good questions to ask. So thanks. Well, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, um, I mean, first of all, just thanks so much to the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee for bringing this forward. I know, you know, we've talked for a while and having this, this tool in front of us and the run through, super helpful to kind of see in practice how we could do this. I am hopeful um, that uh, even the work that we're gonna be doing with Creative Discourse, the consultant that um, the city council and uh, city has hired to help with this work. I mean, that seems like a, a great kind of um, project working with a staff on how to, to do budgeting. I mean, to me, you know, budgets are such a moral document and how are we living out our values in, in our budgeting from the ground up, as Jeremy put it. Um, so I, I look forward to, to that uh, in the future and, and think, you know, even this year, even at this point in the process, uh, it's really helpful to think through. And, you know, I continue to wrestle too with the, the fundamental question of, you know, that line of where raising taxes creates its own set of equity implications versus cutting programs, you know, when people are, you know, have more needs than ever. Um, and, you know, I hope there's also thinking we can do about, you know, are there, are there third ways? Are there, you know, places where, you know, can we, if we're gonna do a, a package that raises taxes, can we do some kind of rent relief, right? I know we pushed off property tax deadlines or, you know, are there, are there ways we could think creatively about how to fund programs that we um, as a council and think our community would really want to fund right now that um, are not creating the equity concerns, you know, or try, try to uh, mitigate to the, the best of our ability um, the uh, people that will be harmed by increased property taxes. So hope we can be a little creative around that as well. Um, that was my thoughts, but thank you again so much for bringing this forward. Other thoughts, questions, comments? Right, well, so at this point I, I'm anticipating that we are going to um, use this document as we go through the, our budget conversation, you know, that, that these are important questions to ask ourselves as we uh, deliberate and, and actually to have in mind as we're going into the conversation, um, which is actually why I wanted to make sure that we had this on the agenda for the, the budget conversation. Um, so thank you again and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from you all, all again sometime. <laughs> or just even just checking in about this conversation as it goes. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So next on the list is uh, the Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice uh, uh, ballot request, Thanks. funding request. Um, so um, yeah, I, um, I see that there's a couple of representatives um, from Home Health and Hospice here. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you all, unless Bill, there's not, is anything else that you wanted to say about this before? Okay. Um, all right, I, I'm gonna turn it all over to, uh, to you all. Go ahead. All right. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sandy Roos. I'm president and CEO of Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice. I see some familiar faces here. I'm here this evening with some representatives from the organization as well as some citizens of Montpelier. Um, first of all, Kim Farnham is our Director of Development and Community Relations. Um, Mary Kate Mullman is a Montpelier citizen and she's also on our Board of Directors. We have Alex Vizuski. Um, for Alex, I always uh, carve up his name. He is also a Montpelier citizen and a staff of our organization um, that plays multiple roles in our work and is pursuing a master's in public health because of his work with our organization. So we're pretty excited about that. In addition, we have a Steve Dale here. His dad is on our service and he um, is a member of uh, Montpelier and um, certainly is, is extremely appreciative of those services during this time. So um, once again, thank you for having us and allowing us to present. And I'll be really clear and upfront about our ask. Um, we are asking for a one-year extension of Montpelier's petition rule due to COVID and to allow Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice 
funding request to be a line item on the 2021 ballot in the amount of $23,500. So I have a presentation here to share with all of you. And I didn't know, I know, I believe it was sent to, was it sent to Bill Kim Farnham or who was it sent to? Well, we You're did all, uh, we did all see it. Uh, I, I believe. Okay, Council, so did you see I can okay. go through, I can Perfect. either screen share or I can just go through and tell you what page I'm on. Whatever's easiest for um, all of you. I, particularly for those who don't have it, I think screen sharing would be best and okay. Cameron uh, does uh, Sandy have permission to do that yes okay yes I do great okay what happened here can you see my screen um yes we can great okay even though we've been zooming for a month now um you just never know so <laughs> let's see so really briefly, our mission, um, or just for anyone who doesn't know, we're a not-for-profit visiting nurse association, and we're full service. Um, we actually care for individuals prenatal care um, through end of life. Um, we also are very focused in providing medically necessary home health and hospice care, regardless of an individual's ability to pay. That care is provided under doctor's orders, and that is the majority of the care that we provide. So Medicare and Medicaid funding um, makes up a minimum of 80% of our funding. Um, certainly we also have a mission to promote the general welfare of the community with health promotion and long-term care services. Those long-term care services are non-medically necessary services, but they're extremely necessary for individuals that are frail, disabled, or, or older adults. And it's all those things that allow them to stay in their home um, that delays and or prevents them from having to go into some form of facility living, such as getting their groceries done, doing their cooking, doing errands for them, um, you know, doing their cleaning, et cetera. Um, in addition to that, Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice has really been embedded in community health since the beginning of time, um, actually through the history that I've gone through um, when we took over um, providing in-home nursing care from the town, um, basically, it was uh, focused on maternal and child health care and working with children and families and moms having babies. And um, in addition to doing a lot of community health outreach with regards to clinics, uh, especially vaccination clinics. So this past year, of course, you can only imagine, um, at one point we were considering potentially getting out of the flu clinic business. Um, because you can go anywhere and get a flu shot. You can get it at the grocery store, Walmart, pharmacies. Your uh, providers do robocalls to you to make sure you make your appointments. Um, what we found is we are glad that we kept it, and it is something our community expects and businesses. We do still do quite a bit of that work. And we were able to increase the number of clinics we do and partner with the state of Vermont to get more vaccination to expand our clinics this year. Um, certainly, there were a lot of logistics around it. We have a flu clinic team that works on that, um, especially one of our main referral sources, Central Vermont Medical Center. Their primary care practices and doctor's offices were not doing what they call their clinics, where people can just make an appointment to see a nurse, get a shot, and leave. So it was a huge, huge um, lift for us to really put all that in place. Um, we did it. We came together and we worked with the state and we worked with our partners to make sure those that needed to be vaccinated were vaccinated. And um, we also worked with the CVMC patient and family centered team and advocates um, because certainly they were getting a lot of calls of unhappy patients that couldn't get their flu shot at their doctor unless they had a regular medical appointment and had other needs. So we are also working um, with the state of Vermont and the Vermont Department of Health in preparing to work with them to um, administer COVID vaccinations in the community. So um, more to come on that, but we'll be working with all our towns um, in Washington County to set those up and or we'll um, be partnering with different Vermont Department of Health public health settings. So care for all Montpelier residents. Um, roughly, Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice sees 2,800 patients or so a year. 
Um, we have 800 patients on service on any given day. Um, that doesn't mean all those patients get a visit on that day, uh, but certainly it means that they can call us uh, on call. We are 24-7, seven, seven days a week. Um, and we do have weekend staff that work on a regular basis. Um, for Montpelier service numbers, I can say um, this past year in 2020, we haven't, don't have the final results yet, um, but certainly we're seeing about an 8 to 12% increase in the services we've provided to the city of Montpelier. Montpelier accounts for about 16% of our services, the second largest service area in our service area, Barry City being the first. Um, and in 2019, we had growth of about 6% in Montpelier. So, um, as some of you have said this evening, it has been an extraordinary year for our organization. Um, it has been really from the beginning, we were able to be nimble and really meet the demands of our community and be the frontline providers. Our primary care practices really relied on us. Um, because most of our staff, from a clinician visiting staff perspective, have laptops or tablets, we were, they were very able, easily able to work remotely. They were already using Zoom for huddle calls in the morning and afternoon, so a lot of this was already in place in their work. Um, the most we had to do was really manage the, the administrative staff and getting them off-site, and our IT team did a great job. Um, when it came to PPE, of course, most of our work is done in the home. So we have a very small supply closet. Although we have face shields and gowns that we wear periodically for different patients we take care of, we don't have huge inventory. So we had to really jumpstart and um, find our way up through the chain of command because certainly trying to get any sort of uh, PPE, whether it was surgical masks, gloves, gowns, um, face shields, et cetera, were um, pretty close to, you know, slim to none. We were able to get an initial shipment from the state of Vermont, thank goodness, because we were seeing positive COVID patients right off the bat. So um, in addition to that, um, certainly being nimble, we were very able to pivot very quickly. Um, we, had, we were providing face-to-face -face visits. We had to review um, all our patients that were on service, all new referrals coming in, because none of our services stopped. So our doors remained open. Um, like I said, our providers relied on us to potentially put eyes on and or keep in close touch with these individuals that were in their home. They wanted to keep them in their home, in the community, out of the hospitals, out of the ED. They want, you know, we were all working to really protect each other. Um, we actually had expanded offerings to those individuals that we bring care to in transitional settings. So sometimes people think that home health, basically you have to have a home and that's, you know, where you receive your care. Um, we've been providing care to individuals that are homeless, that are in transitional housing. Um, lots of people we see are couch surfing, especially in our maternal and child health program, um, a term we use, you know, within. So really, we are really trying to support all walks of life um, with this. With COVID, it expanded that much more. We were involved in a lot of community um, groups that we have been involved in that were really trying to come together to figure out how do we meet the demands and needs of these individuals in the place they're at. We didn't want them getting in vehicles and being transported, whether it be to the lab or to get a COVID test. Um, Certainly, we also uh, have facilitated meal delivery through the Vermont um, Everyone Eats program. We have a huge freezer downstairs. We deliver to our patients who have food security um, needs. And in addition to that, we also are supporting some of our staff that have some needs with their families right now through that. So um, it's been, been a huge, huge help. And then a lot of what we did, our goal was to really try to keep as many staff as possible employed. Um, so what we did for some of those programs that have had lower volume and we were really trying to keep people out for as much as possible or some of our clients just didn't want anybody coming in but they had needs, we were having staff make phone calls to those clients on a regular basis. If, if they had the capability to video, we were doing that. 
And really, the focus was, do you have what you need? Are you getting your groceries? How are you feeling? Um, to really try to prevent social isolation in a time where so many of these individuals um, just couldn't go out and when they wanted or couldn't have company when they wanted. Um, so, so huge, huge um, lift there. And once again, um, we had assisted livings calling us, uh, community care homes calling us. When the governor ordered the stay home, stay safe, um, my phone started ringing off the hook. So really, we're considered a hub in the community. We work within a lot of these organ other organizations and housing units. You have several of those in Montpelier. And we were really trying to work together to provide them with the support. Some of, some of them have no clinical staff on site. So they were really looking to us to help them with infection control. How do they keep everybody isolated? What PPE should they be using? How should they be doing it? Can we support them in COVID testing? So too, we joined forces with our medical director for physician oversight. Um, with COVID testing, um, as soon as we found out there were tests available, our association, we have an association that works with all the BNAs statewide, we were able to coordinate with the Vermont Department of Health as well as with our local hospitals in all our areas, and we were able to provide and go to people to administer COVID tests. So once again, people from all walks of life um, our homeless population, those in transitional housing. We were going to a lot of the motels and hotels, um, very close in touch with the Good Samaritan to keep individuals in place, to do the testing there, to prevent them from having to get in a vehicle and go somewhere else to get what they needed. Also, while we were there, we were assessing their situation. Did they have food? Did they have what they needed? If they had a family and children, did they have internet access for those children to access school? Did they have a computer? And we were working with, like we normally do, but kind of in high capacity, um, you know, with other organizations to get these individuals what they need. Um, once again, I discussed we partnered with Central Vermont Medical Center and also the state of Vermont to facilitate referrals. Central Vermont Medical Center have it, had a COVID call center, and we were working through them to um, be able to administer the tests under a doctor's order with our medical director um, and replace kits as we use them so we would have adequate supply of testing. Um, and then also providing education and support to assisted living and community care homes, as I mentioned in the prior. So once again, um, just really that being able to be nimble and pick up where we needed to kind of start taking off was um, pretty amazing and something I'm, I'm pretty proud of that the staff could do so easily. So significant reducing exposure to the virus. Really, when you think about it, the virus needs to be contained in the community. When individuals get to the hospital and they have it, they're still coming out, right? So our goal as an organization, we put together an internal COVID team, was really about how do we contain the virus in the community? So what that meant is we had to go people and get them, give and get them what they needed. Um, we've had a telemonitor program in place since 2007. We were the second VNA in the state to put that program in place. Interestingly enough, um, it was really hard for physicians to start to adapt using technology as a way to assess patients and keep them healthy. And I can honestly say this past spring, um, everybody adapted it and we are moving forward and have some really close relationships that have been built as a result. The one thing we did do in October 2019 was we actually had updated our program and um, our, our system that certainly enhanced the capabilities of our telehealth program um, with video visits, educational materials, et cetera. So um, utilizing telehealth really allowed us very quickly to pivot um, we already had it in place. We already had some staff that were using video. Um, we have a telehealth manager that oversees a panel of patients, of 70-plus patients. Um, we actually ordered additional tablets and monitors so we could use them in, under all different um, situations. And in addition to that, we had some iPads to use. Um, sometimes we would even facilitate a physician visit 
where the physician would want to do a visit with the patient, but they wanted the nurse there so that we could right then and there talk through what that person's needs were and automatically change the care plan and everybody's hearing the same thing versus there being a communication gap. Um, and expanding connectivity and providing essential care to those patients that are really at high risk for hospitalization. So I think we're finding as we go through the data um, and with our main referral source and doing some surveying and that, that um, some people were able to continue and a lot of people were able to continue to access the healthcare they needed because they were working with organizations such as their physicians going to telehealth, partnering with their home health agencies and other social service agencies to be able to put eyes on these individuals and get them what they needed. So that was a really significant role for us. And um, one other thing with connectivity, we actually worked with the Green Mountain United Way um, and really trying to, uh, once again, get individuals connected to Wi-Fi or cellular access, whether it be for them to continue to receive medical care or for them um, to be able to get their children access to school. So really, really important. Um, I know we had one situation um, as well as we skip to the history of partnership with Montpelier. We've seen an increase in our maternal and child health care services that have a lasting impact on individuals. We've seen this across all the towns that we serve um, in our service area. I myself actually benefited from these services 18 years ago when I had a high-risk pregnancy. But certainly what we know in healthcare is for chronic disease to, for that curve to change and for us to really keep people healthy, we need to start prenatally, we need to start with children, we need to start with parenting and education. And so we've done that. Through this crisis and through this extraordinary time that we were in, um, all of our nurses uh, in, our, in that program are certified in, in lactation support. We had one mom who had a newborn. She was scared to death because she was struggling breastfeeding that baby. Our nurse geared up and all her PPE went out to see that individual spent quite a bit of time in that home to get things going well so that that new mom um, young new mom was comfortable feeding her baby, supplemented it during the week with video visits and went back because they didn't want to have too many visits too close together to really limit the exposure. That patient wrote to this team and was so thankful for the service and admitted that I don't know what I would have done if I couldn't feed my child. Thank God you were there because there were no other services available and frankly, I felt like committing suicide. When you read something like that and when you hear something like that as a provider, that's significant. In addition to that, with Montpelier, we have had a long history of voter support. Every time we've been on the ballot, the community has supported us. This is what the voters want. Um, Montpelier, once again, makes up about 16% of our total visits organizational-wide and um, is the second largest service area that we serve. And primarily, um, we do not deny referrals. Um, we are mandated, um, first of all, we are regulated and we can't. Um, the only time we can is, is if we cannot meet the medical and social needs of that individual. And we go through a rigorous process with the state if we don't accept that client. Once, and also, as I mentioned earlier, we have seen an increase in the number of Montpelier residents that we're seeing. Supporting Montpelier residents, um, the Mar Montpelier Chief of Police, Brian Pete, was, um, did an amazing job in, in organizing a thank you parade for our staff. Um, it happened at the end of October. We were very excited about it. Our staff know um, public safety officers pretty well. Um, they're pretty intimate with uh, the EMS crew. A lot of the work we've been trying to do is really making sure that we all as first responders are using our resources adequately. So we are we feel really good about having good relationships. We're actually piloting some work in Barry City with their EMS team right now 
And if it works well, we hope to start trying to replicate it with other towns and cities EMS staff. Um, but ultimately, we want these individuals to be able to respond to things that really need their response. So how do we work together to do that? Why we need town funds? Um, certainly one of the key things is we reach vulnerable individuals, including people with low mobility and transportation challenges to provide essential medical care and certainly COVID testing and treatment. This was significant during this and in this pandemic, and we continue to do that. We are seeing um, positive COVID patients on a regular basis. We are going out testing individuals on a regular basis, not only the individual that is the patient, um, but inevitably some of their family members. When we walk into a home, it's very similar to an emergency department. We do not have control over who's been in there. So ultimately, we gear up, we go in, we try to help the situation that's happening. We've been doing a lot of this testing um, just because it's part of our mission. How are we gonna keep the community healthy and safe? We've been providing care to people at home. This in itself reduces the exposure and the community spread of the virus. So we're working very closely with monitoring our staff, screening our staff, um, and making sure that they are not a vector for spread. Um, I'm pretty proud to say, and hate to even say it to a degree, but we've only had three staff um, that have been positive. And actually two of them are a community acquired, and one um, was in a facility and with a recent outbreak, and they were doing postmortem care for a hospice patient. And I think it was just really hard to not be close together and with the outbreak happening it was, it was certainly a fluke and, and no fault on, on anyone's part per se. And also, I think really in this, this moment of time during <laughs> these extraordinary times, we were able to expand healthcare options. So by being able to really stand up and mobilize and provide telehealth, provide face-to-face, -face, provide phone, and really not skip a beat, so to speak, and make it happen when it needed to happen, was really key. And it's really important that we're able to be able to keep people in the community and not being having to be transported around to get what they need when they need it. And really having a good working relationship um, with the towns that we work with, with public safety officers, with our local referral sources and other community service organizations. Um, I know a lot of them called us and we called each other for support, whether we're working um, with our local food bank or Capstone or Good Samaritan or, you know, um, the housing task force in Montpelier because we have, you know, we're seeing patients that are, that are homeless. You know, how do we manage that and get them what they need when they, when they need it, where they need it? So that I know is fairly quick. I know I had a short amount of time on the agenda and I am certainly open to answering any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Um, if you, oh, it looks like you're um, stopping to share your screen. Great. Um, yep. Comments or questions from folks? Uh, Donna and Connor. Well, uh, Sandy, I'm just so impressed that you really showed the, the broadness of your services and the depth of your care and involvement in our community. It's very impressive. You know, I have people who've used Central Vermont Home Health, Hospice, and I think I know about it, <laughs> but you showed me how much I didn't know. And I really feel for your workers because they're right in the home. So I'm glad that you're doing all you can to keep them safe and that so far it seems to be working. I really appreciate you. Right. Thanks, Donna, I appreciate it. Great, thank you, Connor. I, I would just echo Donna. Um, I, I, I was watching the news the other day. And I saw like a hospital ward with like a bunch of like selfie sticks with like iPhones on them, um, just all across the hospital ward with people who were like on their last legs. And that was the only right. mechanism they had to say goodbye to their family. So, you know, some of the situations you guys are in and uh, how you pulled through over the last few months has just been incredible. And I, I, I think, uh, you know, some of the workers are the heroes of this whole pandemic here. Um, 
I, I had an old uh, mentor, Tom Moore, who passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but mm -hmm. he always said, like, Steve Dale had the, the best heart in state government. So just seeing Steve there in a, uh, in, in a situation where, you know, he's re reliant on this, um, it, it kind of hits home. So I, I really hope the voters of Montpelier um, come to the table for you and get you by this tough time. So thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Yeah, other thoughts or comments? Uh, Dan and then Jack. Sure, I just actually have a procedural question. So because Sandy's asking for um, to be put on the ballot, will we be, we'll consider those at the January meeting when we start to finalize or is this something where we're looking to take action now or? So that's a good question. I, I think that we are looking to take action on that now. I, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, but I believe we can um, uh, do that sooner rather than later. Like, we don't have to do it at that last meeting um, necessarily. That's just the, the final day that we could put people on, uh, that, that uh, Thursday in January or so. But um, I, I think particularly... So, sorry. Uh, so I, I think particularly the um, you know, one of the reasons to consider it now is so that they know whether or not they have to go find 600 signatures um, and whether or not we'd be asking that of them. Um, right. And I, I, I'll just speak for myself. And um, since, we're, since we're talking about it, um, I, I think particularly because uh, Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice was on the ballot last year and it passed and they're not asking for any increase in funding. I think that um, that alone uh, makes sense uh, to put them on the ballot for this year. And I, I, think I'd, I think it'd be important for us to put some parameters around that because um, you know, we don't uh, necessarily know what the rules are gonna be around um, other groups. Um, so, but I mean, in addition to to those qualifications, I mean, just the fact that um, you know that they are dealing every day with potentially uh, positive COVID uh, cases. I don't think we, you know, asking uh, that even this particular crew even to to go around um, collecting signatures, I think, um, would be ill advised. Um, so I I'll leave that there for for my comments on that. But Dan, did you have something yeah, um, no, I, to follow I, up there? And then Jack, go ahead. Sure, I mean, I, 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 I think your points are right as, as we start to distinguish between these requests for um, funding or petitioning uh, items. And I guess I would add on top of that is the fact that because this service is so essential in this year, um, that even if those other factors weren't there, I would give serious consideration to this request because of the work that they're doing and its relationship to what we're experiencing right now as a community and as well, really as a globe. Um, and so I, you know, I'll just put that out there that I, I have no problem. I just want to make sure we do this in a timely manner. Um, yeah, fair enough. Uh, Jack. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. I think, uh, like everyone else, I agree this is a, a very uh, worthwhile organization that pay, provides vital uh, services to our community. Um, and obviously, the voters of Montpelier, if we put this on the ballot, the voters of Montpelier will make the decision about whether to support it or not. And my prediction is that they would support it uh, with an overwhelming majority, which is what typically happens. Um, I'm curious. Are you uh, going to the other towns you serve, making a pitch for a commensurate uh, level of funding and getting commensurate level of funding from the other towns? Yes, we actually are funded by all the 23 towns um, that we serve and it's all of Washington County and three towns in Orange County, um, Williamstown, Orange and Washington. And we have a whole process that we go through with regards to how we determine funding, the requests that we make. 
to each of the towns. Um, it's based on per capita as well as percentage of visits, and we also look at the census as well. Oh, that's that's very helpful. Um, yeah. you, just to follow up on Councilmember McCullough's question, are you seeking the same uh, to be placed directly on the ballot in those towns, or are there other processes? Because we no, have actually, yeah. So actually, uh, the ones that we're going to request um, petitioning have waived it, so there is none. Um, so Mo City of Montpelier is the only uh, town city um, within our service area that this is still outstanding and open. Um, some of them actually put us. Uh, lots of them put us right in um, the budget and or others put us directly on the ballot. So it is a mixed bag. Kim Farnham, our Director of Community Relations and Development, could probably answer more specifically in more detail of how that, how that works. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. I move that we uh, waive the petition requirement uh, and place uh, Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice on the ballot for the uh, fiscal 2022 uh, budget. And uh, I would note that I'm <clears throat> specifically basing this on the fact that this has been a petitioned item that has been supported by the uh, voters in the past. I'll second it. Should we, should we add the amount, 23,500? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Um, just want to check uh, with John. Is that specific enough language, or do we need like verbatim language for you? Um, I'm going to need ballot language. Um, if it doesn't exist yet, um, I mean, you could just build it into, you know, the the motion. You know with the ballot language to be provided. So it should say, so it should say, shall the voters of Montpelier approve the amount of $23,500? I, I think it probably makes more sense for us to um, come up with that language uh, to, to craft the specific language later. So as John is suggesting to say, um, with language, with specific language to be crafted later, because we can approve it um together with the things on you have to approve the final warning and all the ballot yep. items and so what you're doing is instructing that this be placed on the warning and so when you see the final warning and all the drafting uh, drafted articles you'll have a chance to approve the wording then yes yeah. we just put something on and you can mess with it <laughs> basically you're just telling them you don't need a petition you're going to put it on the ballot and you're making is that right. is that okay there jack with your motion yep okay Great, and Donna as well. Yep, yep. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, all right, super. Any further comments uh, from folks, public, anyone? Yeah, um, Madam Mayor, Steve Whitaker. Go ahead, Stephen. I, I want to uh, second and commend the frontline high risk uh, work hazard pay uh, is warranted for these uh, essential services especially in that they're providing them to folks on the street without preconditions. Um, that's, that's excellent. I would ask, is it a, is Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice a, a charitable nonprofit 501c3? Yes, it is. Okay. So, so that I raised that question in the sense of uh, public money going in the transparency requirements, the 990 that's filed uh, and should be available would, Disclose. Some in some areas, these types of agencies are uh, very top heavy with their salaries, and I would rather see the money go to the folks doing the doing the work. Uh, secondly, when you mentioned connectivity, I would encourage you to get your uh, comments in tomorrow is the last day for comments on the public service department's uh, COVID response tel and telecom telecommunications recovery plan and mm -hmm. your, your requirements for bandwidth and the minimum bandwidth requirements to do the telehealth services that you're doing uh, need to be registered there because they're headed down a path that uh, would serve inadequate bandwidth for what you need to do. So uh, y'all are a good constituency to argue for better bandwidth. So uh, thank you for your work and for uh, I'll support your effort. Great, thank you. 
Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, Steve, go ahead. Uh, just a quick comment. First of all, thank you for uh, your support for uh, Central Vermont Home Health. Um, my, uh, my father came to live with us a year ago today. Um, he turned 100 on June 9th and uh, wanted to thank the uh, police department and the fire departments in Montpelier for uh, being part of a massive parade on Terra Street that was uh, something to behold. Um, but it is uh, little did we know what was about to happen. And I have to tell you that the services that we've gotten through this agency have been, um, have, have allowed this to be uh, a really uh, terrific year, um, an experience I never would have predicted. But you don't want to be taking a hundred year old man into doctor's offices for COVID tests for he had um, you know, um, congestion um, in his head. And of course the concern was what's going on? Does he have COVID and so on and so forth. And um, uh, having the steady support um, in, in the home uh, has been an absolute lifesaver uh, to say nothing of um, some regular personal care services uh, in our home that's made it really possible for this to be a an excellent um, experience and we have been really uh, blessed to have him with us now for a full year as of today and actually today is his hundred his hundredth and a half birthday so uh, anyway thanks to all of you and thank you for your great work thank you um, other thoughts or comments Okay. Well, then I just um, want to thank um, yes. all of you, all of the council members that I spoke with, just helping us navigate these waters as a mm -hmm. newcomer, newcomer to uh, municipal government. So it was really helpful. And thank you very much. And uh, a lot of your comments just warmed this epidemiologist's heart. Mm -hmm. here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are so grateful for the work that you do. It is. Um, even more important now, and that certainly came through in your presentation. Um, so thank you again. Um, so I think there, so there's been a motion and a second. Is there any further conversation? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, um, thank you. And uh, we'll uh, be rooting for you on town meeting day. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so Donna is asking for a break, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes, Bill. I suggest that we have the pending question on the waste, the water resource recovery facility that um, Warren raised. That we do that and then take a break and then go to the budget. I think that. It, um, Yes, that that would be okay with me as long as it's okay with others. Donna, you're gonna be okay. Uh, I'll just skip out and come back. Okay, that's that's fine. Fair enough. Um, great. Okay, I, I think I think that makes sense. Um, all right. So, uh, Lauren, go ahead. What are your thoughts on um, this item? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so. I was trying to get clarity, like when we had had a conversation back in February as a council um, about uh, the PFAS issue um, and the leachate that is brought into Montpelier. Um, at that point, we had asked the question, like, are there, is there a contract for that? And we were told no. I was, and I know that this is for liquid organic waste with some definition. So I, I wasn't clear if this covers the, uh, the leachate. Um, First and foremost, I guess that's one question for for Bill or whoever on staff is. There. I believe it does not. I believe this is the this is the capacity that we uh, supported with the new wastewater treatment plant, the new capacity to take uh, heavy food wastes and those kinds of things. The the leachate comes specifically from the landfill, and there's only that's only one place. We have you know it's the Coventry landfill. We don't take it from any place else. So. Uh, but I think Kurt is on the line, and I believe Donna was. So I would like to have people that are more knowledgeable than me. But I don't. I, I think this is not landfill waste. Kurt was on the line at least. <laughs> <laughs> Give up? I think it's 
Donna. Donna's here. I can see Donna. Um, so. <clears throat> Oh, hey, Terry. This is Kurt. I can, <laughs> sorry, I can speak to this. He's better at this than <laughs> I was muted there. Sorry. Um, so this is really for the new waste stream um, for generation of methane. That's a um, to produce power and under phase two. Um, so there's, you know, the organic waste. This is really food waste. So there's uh, essentially no PFAS associated um, with food waste. It's primarily from waterproofing materials. You know, the study the state did uh, a couple of years ago, or yeah, I think it was about a year and a half ago, um, showed that primarily PFAS is resulting from leachate, like Bill said. So I don't I anticipate these contracts that we're working on now. This is a new waste stream that we've never been able to take before until we did the phase one contract um, because we didn't have the, you know, the equipment in place um, to process it. So uh, th this is not, we have not still developed the contract for leachate yet. We've been really kind of tied up with the, um, with the new waste streams that we're dealing with. Um, so I don't anticipate, like I said, any impact on PFAS levels through uh, these contracts. Okay, that's helpful. They do use PFAS in food packaging. So if we tested more, we might actually <laughs> find that that's not totally accurate. Um, but I don't think that we have data on that right now. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I guess just, I, I just don't want to keep this issue on our radar. And I mean, I do think it's tied into the budget because we make money off of taking the leachate from the city. And so if we were going to go a different route in the future, like that would have budgetary implications. And I mean, I just am still uh, really concerned that we're knowingly taking a, a, you know, a product into, into our community that like, stays around forever and it doesn't break down it's mobile and gets into water um it could contaminate people it could create a cleanup project in the future so i just i just want to keep bringing it up that I, I think we need to deal with it and i know we've been in like crisis mode and have lots on our plate um but just seeing this contract kind of re-raised for me that, <laughs> that just wanting to keep this on our on our mind so that we you know maybe after we get through budget and later in January or February could relook at, you know, what our options are, or at least like what data should we be starting to get to make it better informed um, decisions about our options, which I think it is a situation where there are not great options, um, but nonetheless, just keeping doing what we're doing is continues to concern me that we're creating problems down the road for the community. So I'll, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, just to, just to follow up real, really quick, Lauren, if you don't, um, if I yeah. could, uh, I did have a discussion um, last week with uh, a member of the um, state wastewater management division. When we had spoken with the state in February, I think you know we were looking for some sort of um, surface water sta discharge standard from them, and they're still working on that. They have not uh, created the surface water discharge standard. Um, you know, basically, there's a drinking water standard of 20 parts per billion. Uh, and that's for Vermont, and then EPA has the 70 parts per billion, um, so which is right around where our effluent is, is right around the EPA standard. Um, so I think what our plan was, I believe, from our last meeting uh, uh, regarding PFAS, was to come back and uh, once the surface water standard was established, that we would, um, you know, revisit it and see you know, how Montpelier compared to that standard. I'm not yeah. sure if that's what I know. How you thought it would be. The, the last conversations I've had with the DEC, it, it's probably going to be years before they develop that standard. So I just, I think like doing nothing in the interim, not even collecting data. I, I just, I would like to continue the conversation of, if, if nothing else, better understanding what we're bringing into the community and what implications it might have. Um, totally hear you. It's, it's like, it's very hard to deal with because there's not good federal action on it. And every state's kind of grappling with how to deal with this kind of emerging contaminant concern, but um, knowing that bringing it in and potentially creating a, a problem for our community, I just, I think we can do better than just sit there and wait and keep doing it. And we will have the water and sewer budgets in front of you in February. So it might be a good time to dig into that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, is there a motion regarding uh, item B from the consent agenda? 
I'll, I'll make a motion to approve uh, the contract um, for uh, the waste hauler contract uh, as presented. A second. Any further discussion on this? Uh, okay. Um, all right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And oppose. Okay, so that item passes, and we're going to take a break. Uh, it is 844, so I'll see you back here in 10 minutes. 944, or, yeah, 844. 854, oh. <laughs> uh, as we go into this uh, budget conversation, I, um, assuming I'm just going to turn it over to Bill, and, and then I'll have some thoughts to share afterwards. Uh, so go ahead. Thanks. Uh, first of all, hopefully, so um, you should have all received uh, the budget delivered electronically uh, Friday night, uh, and then maybe a revised version on Monday. Uh, some of you that wanted books, the books are here. We have, I think we have books for everybody if you'd like them or not the concern. <coughs> I'm going to do a very quick uh, summary, basically just a fine-tuned version of what you saw last week, uh, now that we have some details, to set up the conversation and really want to get right into the meat of it. So if I, if I may, I'd like to share my screen, assuming I can. Is that, may I do that, Cameron? Now you can, yes. Now I can. Beautiful. All right. That is not what, uh, all right, hold on. Oh, there it is. Um, so hopefully people can see this. Yes, am I, is my screen on? Yes. Great. Okay, well, um, last week we gave you a pre preliminary budget overview. This week is really the proposed budget. Um, this, a lot of this is going to look really familiar, but I will get through it uh, relatively quickly and point out the highlights. Again, the FY22 budget, uh, our, the real story of this was the major budget gap due to COVID. We needed to deliver responsible services, implement our strategic plan, and we based it on a one-year COVID-19 horizon, which really at this point is more of a one and a half year because we're talking about between now and uh, June 30, 2022. And acknowledging that residents and businesses are have been hurt by COVID, uh, both emotionally, physically, and financially. Our strategic plan priorities uh, set up are community prosperity, COVID-19 response, environmental stewardship, more housing, responsive and responsible government, and sustainable infrastructure. So what, what were the problems? As, as, again, I won't go into these in detail, but we had major revenue shortages, uh, including uh, parking fund shortages that had offset expenses in the general fund, leading us to about a million dollars shortfall. We also had some built-in uh, expense gaps, including, uh, as fate would have it in this year, a 27th pay period, which uh, just added one more, you know, one segment of cost. Years, uh, making co a combined gap of just under one and a half million dollars. So the budget we provided, uh, we really did didn't really focus on any one area. We looked across the board at everything. We've held six positions vacant. We reduced the capital and equipment plan. We've at this point held some funding vacant in external and community funding. Although um, I know that will be a conversation tonight. Uh, our operations funding is down and it assumes no ballot items, which that has already changed. So that was a way of closing that gap. Um, so as, as uh, laid out, it has a 2.4 cent, 2 cent tax decrease, a 2% reduction. And, and um, that is not meant to be sort of playing smoke and mirrors, I do recognize that, that what that really means is there's some funding left for the council to allocate where it wants to if uh, if they want to still keep it at a zero. We 
We included uh, Montpelier Alive, the equity consultant that was talked about earlier, MEAC, the social worker, the library ballot item, all our personnel cost reallocations, and tried to keep basic services. So here's the key budget issue, or one of, I mean, they're all key budget issues, but certainly one I think is on everyone's mind. There is 208,000 in reduced property tax revenue. However, um, there were those five key items, the community fund, the housing trust fund, the Montpelier Development Corporation, the homelessness task force, the public arts, arts fund, which right now don't have any money in the budget. At the FY21 level, uh, that was uh, 406,050. That was what we had budgeted initially pre-pandemic. And then when we made the adjustments in uh, June, I guess, when we, for, for FY21, the, the COVID budget mitigation plan, that total reduced down to 298,550. Uh, so there's uh, clearly a challenge there. I would say to you that um, as we kick this off, one of the key decisions you want to make in, in the same way that you just dealt with the CVHHH um, ballot request, I would say a decision on the community fund is probably very important to make early because it, will, it also makes a difference whether people petition and um, giving people a clear signal what's going to happen with that. I'd also say that um, while I won't back away from what I signed my name to, I have thought about it since we sent that out Friday night and probably if I had a do over, I would have included that line fully in the budget. It goes to a lot of agencies of needy people and left the others out. But I really felt it was important that you, you're the policymakers, these are community funds and that it's your place to set these priorities more so than staff. We can set the priorities for operations and which roads and which equipment and those kinds of things, but um, the, these are really your calls. Um, and as we talked about last year, last week, um, is the one year horizon the possible, probably the responsible choice? Did we get the funding uh, priorities right? Is the strategic plan adequately addressed? And there should have been material, there was material in your budget book um, analyzing the strategic plan. What are priorities for restoration if, if uh, revenues are approved and what is the appropriate tax rate for this year? As I said, our goal in the budget was to not increase the tax rate. We actually gave you a couple of cents to play with um, as you want to think about putting things back in uh, or of course accept it the way it is and reduce the tax rate. Uh, so with that, the we're at the schedule. This is today's workshop. We have another one scheduled for January 6th. How we get tonight will probably determine whether we want to add a third one in there. Uh, public hearing on January 13 and a public hearing on Thursday, January 21. I will say for the new folks going through, uh, the public hearings can also be more a budget deliberation. Um, just because the council sets the preliminary budget on January 6 to go to public hearing doesn't mean you can't change it uh, after public hearing. So the, so the two workshops aren't your only chance to fool with the numbers. As we mentioned earlier, our goal is to have the uh, water and sewer budgets to you in February uh, to discuss those budgets since those don't go on the ballot but are still important. And then our residents will be voting on the general fund on um, March 2nd and the early voting to start. So that's our schedule. That's the outline. So of course, always happy to answer uh, more questions. Um, and Happy to answer any questions or have you start off. I do have the worksheet that I sent out that at any point I can pop back up on the screen. If we have to clean it up, I assume we don't need it until then. I have already updated it and put the um, CBHHH ballot in. So I'll stop talking. Okay. Uh, so just for uh, some context here, and I, I see you, Connor. Um, I would like to take up the issue of the community fund first, uh, because I think that that is uh, urgent, uh, really. And I guess I would also just advocate that 
Uh, I think there are a lot of reasons to uh, just include this in the budget to add this back in. Um, I have more, I, well, thoughts I could share about that, but I, I also see uh, some folks have turned their videos on. Um, so uh, before we uh, get to your comment, Connor, um, I want to give the opportunity, uh, Christine or, or Judy or um, others, any, any um, folks that would like to comment on the Montpelier Community Fund? No, that's okay. <laughs> I'm just giving lots of thumbs up. Her hand up. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Thank Sorry? You, um, oh, yes, go ahead. Thank you. So, Christine Zaki, um, I'm the current chair of the Montpelier Community Fund Board. Um, Amy Cunningham, Michael Sherman, and Judy Sher um, Sturm uh, Sturmer is, are all members of the council who are on as well. Um, and thank you for approving a new member to our board this evening as well. Um, so we shared a memo with you um, um, on Tuesday, and I don't want to reiterate the contents of that, um, but would just briefly say that um, that our concern with um, the potential to not see any funding in the Montpelier Community Fund is really twofold. It's the real financial and human impact on the nonprofits, the programs, the services that make Montpelier the community that we know and love, and also it's the precedent around process. Um, and so it's, it's both of those issues combined. Um, it's already past nine, so I'm going to leave it there and refer council members to the memo that I shared with you earlier this week. Um, and, you know, our, our other board members as well as myself are more than happy to engage in discussion or questions. Thank you. Um, Connor, I know I sort of cut you off there earlier. Was it about the community fund? It wasn't, but um, yeah, and it's probably in the budget big book. I'd love a breakdown of those uh, 39 recipients of uh, community funds, uh, funding, if that's possible at some point. They're posted on the website. The past ones are. Okay. Yeah, I don't think they're in the budget book, but we, we do have <clears> them. <throat> okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, I agree, past uh, precedent, uh, also these other organizations knowing whether or not they're going to have to get signatures. Um, uh, they, they should, again, if, if we're not going to put them in the budget, they should know that now. Um, so um, any other thoughts? Uh, Donna, Donna's giving a thumbs up. Donna, would you like to make a motion? <laughs> I would, but I sometimes rush you and you don't want me to make a motion yet. No, uh, it's okay if you want to. This one. <laughs> I, I'm going to make a motion for the Montpelier Community Fund to be put into the budget at the 131050, what it was for this year. I'll okay. second that. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Um, further discussion on this? Okay. I'm not seeing any discussion. It's very interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's, it seems like this is something we need to do. Um, all right, so um, uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I guess if we want to sort of mull it over a little bit publicly, you know, the community fund strikes me as our, our version of the United Way, which is, <laughs> you know, these are 39 different recipients that are of different, you know, they range from the arts to human services to other important features and my understanding is the community fund was even created to 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 stop this sort of hodgepodge uh series of independent alloc budget petitions um and that of course would be undone by zeroing this out so that so you know this strikes me as as a strategic um you know return to the budget that serves a lot of the the services and worthy organizations that we would otherwise be parsing out one by one by one 
and that's the whole reason to have the community fund board to do that. So I, I support this. Uh, thank you, Jay. Well, I just want to add too that um, I want to thank Christine and and folks from for putting together that that memo and that pie chart that really shows the diversity of organizations that this fund supports. I think that that's really important um, as we think about putting it back in the budget. And, and the other piece of it too, as we is concerned about creating a situation where um, folks are having to compete and we think about um, trying to you know get on the ballot and compete for attention and campaign and invest very very limited resources um, to, uh, to, uh, to try to uh, connect with city resources that I just think would create a process that is just really unnecessarily and, and not serving our community. So thank you. Other comments? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Um, one thought I have is that although we're talking about putting it in at the level of $131,050, um, it's conceivable that the uh, the fund board would, by by making decisions on what they're uh, what they're supporting, would go for either a higher or lower level, or is this the total of the uh, funding requests that they have at this point? That's a good question. You, um, would you like to speak to that? Budget. Sorry, Bill, what? This is the total of last year's budget. Okay. Um, and in fact, we started with a slightly higher number and they came in with a, you know, I think it was six or $7,000 reduction based on their recommended awards. But I think what the council would be saying is, you know, this is your cap. Okay, thanks. Okay. Great. Uh, Ma Madam Mayor, I have a comment or a question. Go right ahead. Uh, it, is it, um, and I part forgive if I have, if I've missed a key decision, uh, has there been any thought to whether or not we could, in this budget process over the next month, uh, kind of create priorities for should there be federal uh, grants much more flexible than were uh, in the first CARES Act made available, uh, could they be pre-designated to add up some of these things like the community fund, uh, specifically without having to rehash the entire budget process? Could there kind of be a placeholders put in for those that will get up if uh, the deficit is uh, remedied through federal action. That's a, a great question, and I, I think uh, it speaks to, um, in addition to whether or not the um, uh, federal government or other money becomes available for municipalities, uh, it also is, is tied, I think, to the question of what happens if more if we just have more money than we expect to have as a result of uh, the recovery from COVID um, and for that um, we're we are already talking about having um, what we're calling a build back uh, list and I think um, that question of uh, potential for federal money would be uh, a part of that discussion as well, like where where does that money go towards? Like what would we fund? Um, should we have more than we expect? So so it's a good question, and um, I uh, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the the plan is to um, come up with what our base budget is, and then after that discussion is um, more or less completed, to figure out um, so what what we need to be thinking about beyond what was in the, the base level budget. That's correct. We have to bring the amount of property tax budget to the voters in March. Um, but if we get other revenues and we can add more services or, or projects or whatever to them or funding, um, then we would, we do want to think about that. And since this is, these cuts are all driven by the loss of revenue. 
So just sequentially speaking, that conversation would be happening the soonest in February. Um, ballpark. Um, but thank you. Um, other other comments or questions? Okay, so there's a uh, oh, uh, yes, uh, Christine, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to elaborate um, on the answer that Bill gave to um, Councillor McCullough, just to say that the total amount of requests that the community fund received this year was $190,190, so just shy of $200,000. Um, so taking out Central Vermont Community Hospice, you know, which now is going to the ballot, that would mean that leaves us with uh, $166,690 in requests. We, we will adhere to the cap that the council has set for us. Um, and so that means that, you know, right off the bat, even if, um, uh, you know, that, that we would be looking at $36,540 um, in requests that would not be able to be funded, if that makes sense. And if the council would be interested in keeping that in mind, should other funds be available in February, just putting it out there. I mean, that would be interesting, certainly, um, especially as you go through your process and, and make recommendations or, you know, or not. Um, so I'm actually keeping that in mind, you know, if, if there are, uh, if you all want to come back to us <laughs> um, with that um, a suggestion in, in line with that, you know, that would be, that'd be useful. Um, okay. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay, um, there's been a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Uh, thank you. A awesome. That's uh, it's nice to, to have that clear and, and done. And thank you again um, to the Community Fund Board for all your work, um, and uh, we look forward to hearing back from you all. Thank you. Uh, okay, so at this point, um, we do have uh, a few other, uh, well, actually, just to, um, to wrap that up, uh, I don't know if anyone else is, uh, has their a budget spreadsheet open. I know that was that was shared with us earlier, um, but it might be good to include that amount in in our budget spreadsheet for those who are keeping track. Uh, but Jack, go ahead. Um, I uh, I thought the uh, the budget book from the uh, manage, manager and and from Kelly was very good. Kelly, thank you. I will come in and pick it up. I didn't make it in to the police today um, or yesterday. Uh, I thought the, uh, the discussion about the, uh, the services that are being, uh, that had not been funded at this point was, was very constructive. And I would request that we put in uh, 50,000 for the housing trust fund as the housing task force requested and 45,000 for the homelessness task force. There's uh, a, a really pressing need. And I think that uh, even in tough times, you know, that times are tough for the those of us who uh, own our homes and put, pay taxes uh, in the city. I, I think they're much tougher for the uh, people who are uh, living without housing. And so my edits would be plus 50,000 on line 38 and plus 45,000 on line 40. Is that a motion? Is that, I'll second that. Yes, that's a motion. <laughs> if that's the way we're doing it, yes. Yeah. That, that's great. Um, I, uh, I support that as well. In fact, those were the uh, same additions that I had. And if I have that calculation right in, in my spreadsheet, 
that puts us at uh, plus 0.2 percent, which I actually think is great. Um, it's close to zero, which I think respects the fact that uh, you know a lot of people are struggling right now uh, and can't absorb uh, much more. Uh, but 0.2 percent increase feels uh, if, we're, if we're able to do quite a bit of good with just a 0.2% increase, I think that is uh, worthwhile. Um, other thoughts? Connor, go ahead. Yeah, no, like I, I would enthusiastically second that. I um, think we had a good discussion last week, and uh, some of the points Dan made really hit home as far as the storm is still coming. You know, we have this moratorium on evictions, you know, with the state. Um, but, you know, this stuff's going to expire, and I, I think homelessness is a very real and immediate threat to Montpelier. And it's not just Montpelier, the surrounding communities that experience homelessness. Um, it's going to pop up in town here. So I, I, I think we can respect that, you know, people don't have too much more to give as far as, um, you know, property tax revenue. Uh, but something like homelessness, I think, rises to the top. Um, as far as something that I think we can all pitch into to make sure uh, that the most vulnerable during this time um, uh, aren't left without anything. So I, I'm, I'm really glad Jack added that. That, that was my two things as well. Great. Other thoughts? Uh, Dan? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just echo it. I mean, while I, I think we have, have to, you know, look at how this money is ultimately spent in the same way that we we reevaluated last year's this current year's fiscal uh, allocation for homelessness um, because of I think things are may change um, you know we may see an increase um, but setting that money aside now is really important uh, because if we don't I, I think we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we're, we would, we're going to kick ourselves for not having done that because of the need. Um, and it, it strikes me that this is, this is one of, you know, if we think about like the home health care and hospice allocations that we made, th this is another one of those issues that's really facing the, um, the community uh, and likely to see an increase. And this, this at least gives us, you know, this fund um, gives us a start. On, on addressing some of those needs so that we don't have to create this from scratch. So um, the only other thing I, I, I would suggest that, um, and I know we have the um, development corporation representatives in, in front of us, um, but I mean, that is one of the items that we did zero out. And I know um, I spoke with Bill Kaplan um, and I, I think that they have ideas about you know what they would seek to um, seek from us, uh, and I think we have to be careful uh, on balancing some of these immediate social needs with um, how is the development corporation or other entities going to help with um, what retail and commercial businesses and you know that part of our community are facing as well with the continued economic uh, limitations brought on by COVID, um, and that's my only. Only concern. I, I I support the adding the the homelessness back, but I I think we have to be thoughtful because I think there's going to be another a couple other hands that may prove important as well. That's a an interesting point, and it it makes me wonder about um, you know it sounds like you know the motion on the table is about um, the money for the homelessness task force as well as the housing trust fund. So in a certain sense, we're considering both of those together, um, but that we could yet consider other things um, at a later date. Um, and then I, I think I saw a couple other hands, uh, Donna and then Lauren. I was also thinking about the Montpelier Development Corps. I was so impressed how they helped downtown stores. And they have such a, a brain <laughs> vault of their board and their outreach that I would like to give them something to work with. I mean, they had a, a very valuable consultant come in and help people. If there are some more 
federal funds available, people are going to need help again. I just think it would be good to give them something. I'm just not sure what the right amount is. Um, Bill, yes, go ahead, Bill. First of all, I think economic development in general is an important priority. Um, you know, and that's why we funded this in the first place. And, and how the, I do want to make sure we're clear that the, the business consultant that was brought in for the stores was actually through Montpelier Alive, not through the Montpelier Development Corporation. So just, and, and Montpelier Alive is fully funded. Um, the, but, you know. Uh, you're the, right. But the corporation had some funds they could get access to. They, you're they right. Raised, the corporation was led the charge to, to do fundraising. They actually gave direct yep. grants to. Yep. Yep. I misspoke. Thank you for the correction. And they are helpful with development projects and those kinds of things. Uh, you know, I, I mean, and so is public arm. I'm not trying to say any of these aren't important, but, you know, these are priorities that need to be decided by you folks and what the level of taxation is going to be. Um, thank you. Uh, right, Lauren. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wholeheartedly support adding back in um, the Housing Trust um, and Homelessness uh, Task Force funding. Um, I, I mean, I, I think to the conversation earlier, making sure that we're we're funding vital community needs right now, I think is more important than ever. And it seems like we're still within a very, you know, with with that equity lens, like a good kind of tax, trying to keep it as low as possible while making sure that we're um, doing a really kind of thoughtful budget to the situation that our community members are facing. Um, I mean, personally, I think for the Montpelier Development Corporation conversation, like I would love to encourage them. They did such a great job fundraising um, from some of the local businesses. I mean, if they, you know, the what in the grand scheme of what they raised was a pittance from the city, I'd rather them look for private dollars for this year and see what they could do and keep it going that way. I'd rather put the money personally towards Montpelier Alive if we had more money and um, funded that way, um, you know, and it would be great if they could keep going and get through this this time. Um, but you know, maybe they'll have a compelling uh, <laughs> proposal to bring to us in the in the coming weeks, and uh, could change could change our minds. But um, but that's my my thought at this moment. I mean, I think you know, I really appreciate seeing in here the um, ongoing commitment to the Montpelier Energy Committee and the you know the net zero work that is underway for the community, the ongoing priority and the social justice contract, knowing this ongoing commitment to that work. I'm really appreciative of city staff and you know overall, I think a lot of great work on the budget. Um, I don't know if right now, since we're in the middle of this motion around these two items, I've got some like broader questions around like what the implications of the cuts are gonna be um, for the, the departments and um, kind of how we've set up the budget to be positioned kind of to Stephen's question of, you know, like what's, I, we've talked about it a few times before and it was a little theoretical and now that we have real numbers, like, you know, what would be the cue um, or like what was the thinking behind how we're, we would be positioned to respond if um, I think the governor in a recent press conference said he was giving a greater than 50% <laughs> chance of actual stimulus funding coming in soon. So maybe it actually is real and we should definitely just be ready um, in case. Uh, so I want to have those conversations, but maybe that's, outside of this motion? Yeah, I think that's true because even it, after we vote up or down this motion, I think we'll still be discussing the budget. So um, that'll still be relevant. Um, but any other thoughts on the housing task force or um, uh, homelessness task force? Yes, I'm Mayor Stephen Whitaker. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, I would ask you to consider uh, it, it's been a year and a half, and all the homelessness task force has got to show for it is a couple of porta potties. So I would ask that you consider uh, one of the council members potentially making in a friendly amendment that you continue you uh, make the award the forty five thousand appropriation to the homelessness task force contingent upon production of a plan and its use as matching funds that they there's plenty of money out there from foundations for that purpose but and it would necessitate some matching funds so by conditioning that 45,000 award on its use as matching funds you could potentially leverage it four or five times and you should require a plan because that that task force has been foundering for 
a year and a half, and it's accomplished little to nothing. So uh, having been a founding member of it, having pitched for its creation, uh, I feel very qualified to ask you to hold that accountable and leverage it into real action. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Dan, go ahead. Sure. I mean, I, I think we're already asking the Homelessness Task Force to come to us. I mean, that was the point of last meeting is that, you know, we do need to revisit the, what their plans are. Uh, I don't think, I think by the time this is, we're through with our budget, we'll have, um, we'll have already gone through that. So conditioning it doesn't seem like a reasonable uh, request to me. And, you know, the idea of matching funds strikes me as, as a little bit of the, the theater that we do with like VPR or any of these organizations where, you know, you, you put out um, an amount of money and require matching funds. I certainly see wisdom in having the homelessness task force seek out grants or, um, you know, additional funding, but it, it, the same time, it, at least my res as one member, my, my response is that I, I think a lot of Steve's comments go to the substantive conversation we're going to have with the task force, not necessarily uh, as a funding prerequisite. Thank you. Uh, Michael. I just wanted to say about um, going out to foundations. I've been doing some research for the social equity so, uh, CJAC because we're trying to raise the money that's that's the gap between what you've offered and what you, you've promised and what we need. And every almost every place I've gone, municipalities are excluded and, and government organizations are excluded from their lists. Hmm. So um, I think if you put that kind of, the kind of condition that's been recommended, you, you're not going to, you, you're just hobbling that group from moving forward. Thank you. That's, that's good to know. But I, I do agree that you know we are going to be hearing back soon from the Homelessness Task Force and look, looking forward to that conversation. Um, all right. Any further comments? Okay. So there's a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. So just as, as a matter of um, process, um, I actually feel like it's probably not necessarily fair to discuss the uh, Montpelier Development Corporation before we've heard from them. Um, I think um, it'd probably be good for us to, uh, to hold on those comments. Uh, for now, uh, but Lauren, you had some other questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would love to just hear a little bit more now that we've got the real numbers in front of us of um, like, you know, we've had some theoretical conversations about how are we, we've got the kind of one year time horizon or a year and a half given when the budget kicks in of kind of recovery time. And so could you just, just describe again, now that the numbers are real, what the what in what you're proposing um what the implications for the city and like the functioning of the staff and like what what risks do you feel like this raises because it does you know I, I really appreciate bringing a a budget that meets these really um you know incredibly challenging numbers um you know and, and what does that mean for for the the departments and like you know where where are people going to be kind of suffering over the, over the next year under this budget because of the cuts that, you know, they've, the uh, departments and you all have put forward to us? That's a great question. And um, I think representatives of virtually all the departments are here and can speak for themselves. So um, I may have uh, particular ones that have some staff reductions talk about those. For the most part, we're reflecting what's already happening um, with actually maybe some putbacks from the sort of current uh, boots on the ground. For example, finance is actually operating right now minus two positions. 
uh, and we've got one retained in the budget, so hopefully they'll be filling one. BPW is down three or four, and we've got them down two. So, so there could actually be a little bit of improvement from what we're seeing now. It'll definitely be stretched. Um, and the same thing with the police has been running. Um, we, we, with one vacancy, we actually have one officer that we, we lent to the state's drug task force, which who they're paying. So that's how we opened up a position. And that's been, you know, since the school resource officers are on hold, that's worked out okay. Um, the, I would say probably the, the biggest hit, in my opinion, is going to be in the rec department. They've lost two maintenance people, uh, which are their two maintenance people. Uh, and the plan for at least this year is that the parks department will assist them. So there will be some stress, I think, on those two departments and with some commitment from really all the rest of us to kick in. And, and when I say that, I'm, I'm not really kidding. Uh, one of the things they do is mowing and at our budget Congress, everyone's hand went up to volunteer to take a turn mowing fields for a day, uh, including mine. <laughs> so I think we're gonna try to to get most out of any you want to know uh let us know <laughs> and, um, but i think you know that would seem to me the biggest strain area but we also don't know if there's going to be rec programs this at least this coming summer um so that was the balance right is what what's going to be the need will the will there be baseball being played on the fields and those kinds of things what kind of effort is, is going to be needed so um in bigger picture, to answer your question about put back, and I think some of that is a policy discussion for this process and now or later. In my my mind only, and this isn't discussed with hasn't been discussed with the team. It really depends on how the funding, what the funding source is, and, and how it looks. So if it's a like a one time, here's a slug of money um, to get you through. My inclination would be to say, let's go back and do more construction projects. Let's, you know, get some of that equipment. Let's let's use it on sort of one-time items to get stay caught up in those areas because we won't necessarily be able to rely on that going into the future. If on the other hand we start seeing program revenues coming back, things get more normal, our parking revenues come back, our fees start coming back, our rooms, meals, and alcohol then I would say then we should start building programs and, and services back and restore some of these positions because that's sustainable going into the future. That's really the operating revenue that we need. So it's not strictly a, here, if you have this money, how would you use it? It depends on the source of the money, the duration of the money. And of course, then there's the whole, if it's a grant for a certain purpose, then obviously we would have to use it for those purposes. So that's my seat of the pants answer to that question. Thank you. If any of the other departments want to weigh in on that question, or if you'd like to ask them, as I said, police, finance, DPW, and RAC are the areas that we're holding positions in. So if you'd like to ask any of them, I think they're all here except maybe RAC. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Yep. So I, I've been resistant in the past to like support cutting any personnel in MPD, and I have been because. Um, I've always thought it would be a cost shift to overtime. Um, it, it would hinder our ability to sort of walk a beat as we put some emphasis into, um, and it might result in officer burnout. So if we leave the position vacant, uh, would it not do all those things, even if we're not eliminating the position? Well, I mean, I can't, I'll let the chief answer this, but, it, you know, I can't say it wouldn't contribute to some of that. As I said, it's it's right now. That's the current level we're operating at. Um, um, you know, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen long term with the school resource officer, but without that position being dedicated to the schools right now, she's essentially taking up that other patrol slot. So we're our patrol slots are the same as they were. Um, but. Uh, I see the chief on. I'll let someone more qualified than me answer. I'm sure he'd like to have at least the. 
Well, well sir, I, I think that you, you, you definitely hit on the head, uh, and, and I appreciate, uh, appreciate you, sir, having that concern because that's what uh, the sergeants and the captain and I have been talking about. Uh, in, in a very stressful time right now, there, we're already having burnout and we're already having low morale um, because of, you know, the, the current conversation and, and what we're trying to do. Uh, to re uh, to reestablish trust within the community, and it is going to. And we, so we're trying to figure out a lot of ways that we can take the administrative lift off of the officers, show them, shoulder them as, as uh, supervisors, and get our officers to be up to, to be more visible. But they're already working a lot of overtime. Um, they're taking over shifts, and uh, it, it, it's been a it's it's been a been a challenge. Um, and, and I really commend them. But at the same time. Uh, other departments within the city uh, are, shouldering, are shouldering a tremendous burden itself. Like, for example, DPW, uh, their burnout, their burnout rate, and, and how they're being stretched, and uh, and then the things that they're meeting. So, we're we're, we're trying to uh, figure out ways that we can all help each other out um, uh, due to the uh, the decreased manning and decreased funding that we're dealing with. Go ahead, there, Connor. So is, is the overtime taken into consideration with the amount we would reduce in personnel then? Yes, sir. That's one of the things I've been I've, I've been looking at. Uh, but I think that for the overtime budget itself, to me, it's uh, this isn't a popular thing to say in this day and age, but I think that the overtime is indicative of the need to add potentially additional personnel. To me, when I see overtime costs going up and then I'm looking at who is taking the overtime, what are we taking the overtime for? Uh, things to that effect. It's, it's, uh, um, yeah, it's a political risky uh, type of recommendation. But yes, I am looking at uh, it, it, it substitutions for overtime and I'm looking at that. But everything is balancing out, at least in my eyes. Great, thank you. Well, and certainly keep us posted on on that. Um, other questions that you all have? I'm just coming back uh, to Lauren. Did we, um, did we answer your question? Was your question answered? Pretty much. I mean, yes, and I'm sure there's like a lot more, <laughs> more detail. Right. Um, right. I mean, I do wonder before the next meeting um if conversation maybe they've already happened but you know i mean i know a lot of it's guesswork and we'll have to do uh, put the budget out before we'll have certainty um and in all almost in all likelihood um but like getting a sense from um our federal and state legislative partners on like you know what are, what are the, the most likely things that they're seeing like what is the conversation of what those um state and local grants are, are shaping up to be or how Vermont would be likely to actually handle that? It, would it be more likely the block grant? Like if, if we can get any clarity, um, just to, to make sure that we're prepping in the right ways. Like you said, I, I do think the one time, the projects, the construction projects and stuff make a lot of sense for a lot of reasons to try to get caught back up. Um, probably almost no matter what the, <laughs> the scenario, that would be the a kind of like shovel ready thing that you could see money coming in for, um, and you know, I really appreciate trying to hold on to the the staffing structure and levels for the city overall, even with open positions for now, but not but looking at holding them so that we're, you know, maintaining the services as best we can in the interim, and then able to fill those as as resources come in. Really appreciate not trying to not using this moment to to shrink services that we're offering our community. Um, so we just offer that as well. Madam Mayor, can I make a comment on this? Um, uh, hold on one second. I don't. I don't think Lauren is done. Go ahead, Lauren. One more. One more quick thought. Just um, so you know, Jack and I are serving on this uh, committee that's really going to be digging into the the budget and what time is spent um, with Chief Pete and um, the other people. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to kind of, to me, like database decisions of allocation of resources and the right levels for our city and all of that, you know, I, we just got underway. So that's, you know, it's 
not ready for, <laughs> for right now, um, which I'm sure is frustrating for some people, but you know, I hope we do that well and right for the community and with lots of community input and um, can hear a lot of perspectives and, and look at that, look at the data um, to, you know, really make some well-informed and thoughtful decisions, um, you know, as we move forward for the community. Great, thank you. Um, Stephen, do you want to make a comment? Yeah, I want to make, uh, I, I know many of y'all are probably tired of hearing me talk about the decades of neglected maintenance. We have a problem with public works, not, not the department. The department just needs greater support. That uh, I'm glad that Lauren just made the comment uh, about shovel-ready projects. I think we should put additional money in the budget for the surveying so that we have, we've got a, a new team in Washington that's gonna put big money behind infrastructure and the ready, the further more ready we are with having already surveyed some of the projects we want to embark with uh, would be we'd be better positioned to get early access to that money secondly we keep ignoring the fact that we have, do not have a plan to catch up we we've got a pipe break every few weeks which totally derails any efforts to catch up it demands all hands on deck and we're short hands so I'm watching this. We're we're taking one step forward with thoughtful planning and you know Donna's engineering expertise and her team, but we take two steps back. We slide two steps back every time there's another pipe break. So we we need to get a real serious commitment of funds and support. And I believe that they are. Uh, I. I think they're discouraged and not really allowed to ask for what they need. And I think that needs to change. I think they need strong advocacy on the council to uh, request and demand to see a plan and, and run it by other engineers and make sure that it's climbing out of this hole. But uh, that's, that's two things. I mean, uh, I've, got a, I've given Donna a list. There's plenty of lists around that having shovel-ready projects and charting a path that's going to avoid this one step forward, two, two slide back uh, pattern that we're stuck in. Thanks. Um, Madam Mayor, if I may, um, to that yes. point, we have freed up surveying money in the capital plan. Um, we talked about that, I think, at one of the earlier budget sessions. Of, I think when DPW was talking about the when they were doing the infrastructure update, the need to be prepared for particularly the State Street project and that that money is now in the cap, it's included in the capital plan. I didn't call it out specifically, but it is in there. In fact, we had $50,000 that was being used for basically to offset one of the staff positions and we've, we've reallocated that data. So it's used strictly for project management. So for surveying and project prep. Um, so that's in the way. And then the, the water and sewer line uh, and, and maintenance plan is actually in the water sewer budgets. It's not in, in this particular plan. So we'll be talking about those. Um, we can go into detail the recent water breaks. I think we're all very attributable to uh, an incident, not an incident, but uh, there was a shutdown at the water treatment plant, which created a water camera spring effect through, which caused a series of breaks that were directly related to that. Um, so somewhat unique in that particular case, but we do have old lines and they do need to be replaced. And um, we, uh, we, the council has approved a long plan to replace them. So we can, we can get in, you know, I don't want to shy away from that conversation, but it's really more in the water and sewer budgets. So if I, if I can jump in. Um, yeah, go ahead. Just to comment, I do appreciate um, the consideration. Um, I think that we did um, a good job um, during our budget discussions about acknowledging that um, we needed to cut a fair amount out of the budget. We selectively chose what we were going to do. Um, we looked at both this year and the upcoming year. Um, project-wise and staffing-wise. Um, we're in the process right now of being able to hire for three positions, which will only leave two vacant positions in the 
upcoming fiscal year. Um, I think um, we'll be offering um, a, a person one of those positions um, in the upcoming week or two. Um, so we're on our way to rebuilding strategically some capacity in the department. Um, I don't want to sound like I'm saying we don't need any um, help or consideration, but um, we're climbing back. We've looked at the projects that we can undertake. Um, we've looked at the fact that it's likely that if there's money coming from the federal government, it'll be infrastructure related um, and that will help us. Um, we are out straight um, on any given day because um, we're short in the management um, positions that we have by at least one, one of those two people. Um, that won't be replaced. And so um, the rest of us are taking on that work and we're trying to innovate at the same time. Um, but um, so I just, I, I just wanted to express those um, situations. I feel really well supported by um, Bill and, um, and Kelly in terms of looking at our budget and the other departments are, um, have all indicated that they will work with us and support us as we move forward. And so um, I, I want to give you um, this um, perspective so that you know that um, we've come together as um, a group to look at the needs that the city will have um, and I think we're poised pretty well, even though we're um, understaffed and under-resourced, we're not in a desperate place at this point in time. Um, certainly if anybody wants to suggest that we deserve to have more money or more staff sooner than later, I'm not going to oppose that suggestion, but, um, and we will have to, um, we will have to amend our plan for how we, um, um, tackle and prioritize infrastructure work um, in the coming year, but um, I, I think we're in the best place we can possibly be for the, the circumstances we're facing right now. Thank you. Um, Jack, and then I just want to be conscious of the time um, and also acknowledge that we will likely have more conversation about the budget um, in, in uh, this is our last meeting in December. Is that correct? Right. So we'll have more conversation in January, but Jack, go ahead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> not knowing anything about uh, federal, but federal grant uh, allocations and how it works. I, I would assume that when we're looking at what is a shovel ready project, I would think that pretty high on the list would be the capital plan projects that we were not able to complete this year because of uh, staffing cuts. And so I think we're, I agree that uh, there's work that needs to be done. And I, I think it would be pretty easy to come up with a list and say, if you give us the money, we can start working on that as soon as the ground thaws. <laughs> No, I think that's right, and, and you know the we're talking about the shovel ready projects because that was the um, that was the key term in the you know the era funds in, in the Obama era uh, stimulus money, but you know there's been no necessarily indication that that's what this money would be for this time around. Whether they would just be general grants to governments or or what? Um, well, I mean, so far there hasn't been any indication any money at all is coming from Washington. Um, but maybe maybe a little now, but um, so so it's everyone's guess is as good as any, but I think whether it's a requirement for a grant or just practically speaking, right? We have a lot of projects that we've planned to do that we put off. And then we have a major sort of East State Street, water, sewer, road, um, CSO, you know, major project which if there's going to be big money coming, we'd love to 
to get it for that. So that's the one that we, we funded to make sure that all the surveying could be done and you know the early engineering could be done so it would be ready to go if, if suddenly some money came for that sort of thing. Okay. Well, I think it's it's interesting too that we're kind of at the place where we're we're thinking about that that future money, um, and you know, and anticipating what that will look like and how we might how we might spend it, um, which I think tells me something about how people are feeling about. Uh, this budget, but I want to reserve that. Like we're not we're not yet done with with this budget, and um, and we'll have further conversation um, about that in January. Um, so unless anybody has any final thoughts for this evening, um, we're gonna move on. Uh, Bill, go ahead. Yeah. So I just uh, related to that. Our next meeting is the January sixth, which really is a budget workshop only. Hopefully. Uh, we may have a consent agenda, but other than that, there won't be anything else on the agenda. The next regular meeting is the 13th. So if there is, you know, whether you think of it now, or, but if there are specific pieces of information or questions you have, or people you'd like to have present at the meeting, or anything like that that you want on the 6th, please let us know so we can be prepared to provide that, because then you will be moving into public hearings. So um, we want to make sure you're... We can answer all your questions or provide, you know, get get you whatever you need. So just to be clear, um, the goal would be on the sixth to have a vote on the budget that we can then use to go into the public hearings. Correct. What typically happens is the city council adopts a preliminary budget or you know the council's budget. So it goes from being the manager's proposed budget to the council to the council's proposed budget to the residents voters. Um, but then you have two public hearings on the council's budget and, and you can change the budget based on those hearings or just on your own conversation. So the one you vote on in the 6th isn't necessarily the one that goes to the voters. The one that you vote on in the 21st is the one is the version that goes to the voters. So, so you have more, you know, in, in years past the council said, well, this is where we are. Let's just go with this. But we still may change it, but at least there's something that's got a preliminary. This is what we're, we're floating out there. Right. Okay. Um, on the sixth, and that's the one you want. Yeah. Uh, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, just a couple of quick thoughts to follow up on the, the conversation. It's been bouncing around a little bit, but <laughs> working my way back. One is that. Um, I wanted to, to, to Connor's question about the SRO and Chief Pete, um, just so folks know that committee has been working really hard and meeting, meeting weekly um, to, to work through this process. It's a large committee. They're you know, gathering a lot of uh, community and constituent feedback right now um, and, and sort of working towards being able to make a recommendation, but ultimately what the committee will do is make a recommendation to the school board. So don't expect a, a decision to, me, to be made on that quickly. Ultimately, from, from a budget perspective, it's, you know, we contribute to half that position. Of course, there's variability in, in the role that that position plays, whether they're in the schools or are a patrol, you know, just out on patrol. Um, but as we talk about the, the budget moving forward, don't expect, <laughs> um, uh, a dis any sort of decision to be made um, in in the near future that would impact uh, what we're talking about, um, uh, and and you know ultimately leave it to, leave it to the chief and Bill and others to to figure out how to best manage that process, um, and then going way going way back a little bit, I, I just two quick points and then a question um, around the MDC. One is um, I, I think it is important to acknowledge that while Montpelier Live um, managed the, the, the business consultant who helped all the downtown businesses. The MDC did help fund that position. Um, so they did, they did play a role there. Um, and they, uh, move, looking ahead, though, I think it's important to, to know that right now the MDC is part, through one of their, through, their, through a project manager, is working with Montpelier Live 
to create a grant program to help bring new businesses downtown to fill some empty storefronts. So they are engaged, you know, via Montpelier Alive as we look, you know, to, you know, New Year's Day and beyond. Um, so th they're doing work on, you know, on behalf of, of our businesses. And so I, I don't want folks to think that there, there's nothing happening there. But to, to go back to what Bill was saying in terms of timeline, um, I'm curious thoughts on how, how do we engage with the MDC ahead of J that January 6th or whatever date that meeting that was so we have an understanding of sort of where they're at, what they're working on in this current fiscal year, and then what they might do beyond. Because if they're not here tonight, and I just want to make sure that they have an opportunity to give a, to to have a voice before we're moving before we you know you know we're moving forward in terms of a, a, a council endorsed budget. So I'm just curious thoughts on what's the best way to do that, and I'm you know happy to you know communicate that what we think is best for that process. Yeah, actually, Bill Kaplan and I exchanged messages today trying to get in touch before tonight's meeting. We just missed each other. Um, so, you know, it's sort of actively looking to have that conversation. Uh, I, I was planning to invite them make, to make sure they were specifically invited for the sixth. Um, and I already got a request from one council member uh, to, to make sure that we did that. Um, and I think if they can maybe provide any advance information about what they're working on, that would be. All right, good. I just wanted to make sure we had that covered. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lauren, did you have something? Oh, just directly on that point, I, I would love if you could encourage like a memo laying out if they got funding exactly what they would do with it. I mean, I think part of my lack of enthusiasm at this moment is I feel like there hasn't been great transparency or understanding or documentation of um, what has been spent. So I would just love like if, we, if we're going to have taxpayers put dollars in, like where exactly is it gonna go? And, you know, I think they very well could make a compelling case, but I would just love to see that in writing before the sixth. So we'd have that information to, to chew on. Great, thanks. All right, as if there's no um, further comments um, for now on, on the budget, then I think we'll, we'll move on. Uh, to council reports. And for this, I, um, I'm going to start with Donna, unless you would like me to not start with you, Donna. No, I'm fine. I have a, one okay. short thing. Central Vermont Public Safety Authority received two proposals in response to our RFP. So we'll be reviewing their telecommunication needs assessment proposals tomorrow night. And we also have set a time aside next Thursday if we need it. So we, we hope to at least have a good solid um, opinion of who we want to interview and we're also considering uh, contracting to have a project manager that will be overseeing the consultant work since we have no staff so that's the latest update uh, great connor all right a couple things um i did send language to ann john and bill today um just on retail cannabis um it is required i did some research by statute to have a vote by the full municipality on Australian ballot. Uh, the decisions of uh, who actually gets dispensaries would be made in the second half of 2022. Uh, but there are a number of advantages doing a town meeting day 2021 as opposed to 22. Uh, as far as thinking of head, as far as zoning, you know, different investments. So we'd definitely like to have a discussion at a meeting prior to January 26. We don't have to get into it now. Um, but just to let you know that that's been sent. I, I can send the whole council that language, I guess, if we don't discuss it over email. Um, so that's one thing. I guess I just wanted to disclose, I'm doing a little work with uh, CV Fiber for community engagement, um, doing surveys with canvassers. Uh, a company I have uh, bid on an RFP and it was the only bid, I think. Uh, but I do want to be cognizant that we do appoint a member to the CV Fiber board there. So I just want to be transparent on that. So. That's it for me. Thanks very much. Great. Uh, Jay. Just, uh, you know, just like last week, I just reminder, if you, if you have some thoughts around the SRO position, there's still time to fill out that survey. I, I'd appreciate it. Um, and that's it. Thanks. 
Great, Dan. Uh, thanks. Just just a quick. Um, there was an incident last Saturday where there was a rally at the state house, and uh, uh, a minor was involved in the incident. And I know there's been a lot of talk around uh, on Facebook and various posts, um, you know, as whether the council's going to take it up. And I, I think it's important that um, uh, Chief Pete and the uh, Montpelier police are investigating it. So it really wouldn't be appropriate for us as a council to take up that issue. H however, you know, I did talk with Bill and it seems like one thing we really probably want to encourage um, is if the state, my understanding is that the state receives permits if somebody wants to hold a protest or if somebody wants to have a rally or something, some event at the state house. Um, and they don't necessarily communicate to the city each and every time. Um, and it would, it would certainly, I think, be a good message for the city to consider sending to the state to say, you know, if there are incidents, particularly in this uh, polarized time and era, um, so that, you know, our police force or city services are aware of it and can schedule and uh, react accordingly. Because I think one of the things that, that did come out of that incident was that, you know, the police were not necessarily aware of, of the rally. I may be getting that wrong, but, um, you know, they weren't necessarily aware that it was, it was occurring. And so, you know, we, we don't necessarily staff appropriately if, if, uh, if we're not aware of it. So it seems like that a better communication with the state would be important. That's all. Thanks. Um, any comments um, for offer on that? If, if not, that's fine. Okay. Oh, all right. Mayor, yeah. I know I apologize about that. You know, we, we, we are uh, doing our best to make sure that we, we, we continue on with um, having our dialogue with the uh, state in regards to um, uh, to these events. What, what caught us off guard is that uh, we weren't expecting, we, we didn't have an in indication that there might have been a population there that uh, that, that would bring this type of, a, of, a, of, a, of an incident. And it, it's, one, it's, it's on our agenda to discuss later on this week, next week with Bill, uh, with the rest of this, with the state. And, um, but again, but next week we're starting to hear rumblings on social media that now they want other people there that the Trump supporters come back. Uh, that so we're we're planning for it logistically for this weekend. Just remind folks too um, that before the election, the chief briefed you about these type of incidents might be happening, and um, but what their plan was. And in this particular case, as I understand, we didn't know that a permit had been issued for state house grounds and what it was for. So. Now we know. Thank you. Uh, Dan, not uh, Dan, um, Jeff. <laughs> um, not much to report, but I will say having uh, heard the commentary about needing uh, to call on people to cover the uh, mowing of the rick field that I have never actually operated a riding lawnmower but I can imagine some sunny day this summer that if, if the need arises, I could be uh, persuaded to give it a try. We could have, we could. Parks employee to supervise you too. That's right, yes. <laughs> and that's all I've got. <laughs> uh, Lauren. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, only thing I just wanted to maybe get on our radar for a future meeting. I would just love to check in on the winter parking ban. I know that was a big change and there's been some, you know, dialogue on front porch forum and all of that. And just was bringing my kids to school the other day and it was a street that there were like four cars with tickets on it. And I was like, how is this going exactly? So we just love to kind of see, get the update from um, our public works crew, um, you know, maybe that, one of those January meetings or something, um, unless there's like a quick update that. Yeah, I see Donna, I know Donna has been really checking it almost daily and she's on, maybe she can give you the short version now and then we can do, I think we were gonna do a more complete version once we've had a month or two's experience with it. But Donna, do you wanna? Sure, thanks. Um, so I think that uh, we've been making substantial progress 
Um, Zach and I have been driving around. We did not, we took a break this week, but um, we had spent the last three or four weeks driving around every morning, looking at all the streets, making sure people were parked on the right side of the road. Um, we saw substantial progress being made um, as we went through those few weeks. Um, we did leave um, warning tickets with no um, cost associated with them on people's windshields. Um, I have to say that Zach um, is amazingly committed to this endeavor. And it, if he saw a person parking on the wrong side of the road, he would stop the car, jump out with a ticket, run up, have a conversation, change the person's entire perspective about what was going on. And the following day, we might see that car on the right side of the road. So, um, so I think it's been very effective. Um, we do have um, a couple of areas where there seem to be a lot of individuals who choose to park there as they're coming into town and they're not necessarily residents and that's where we're um, having more of the concerns right now and people who might come in um, we have um, uh, you know um, uh, small businesses who are doing work at people's homes or fuel um, folks parking the cars on the uh, or trucks on the wrong side of the road so we're working hard on that um, and I do have to uh, thank the police for also um, helping us um, sort of um, help people in the community understand what's going on we have changed a few um, conditions on some streets um, like Baldwin Street, we realized that having people move from one side to the other when nobody's ever moved to the other side of the street ever in the history of um, uh, the city of Montpelier was just a silly idea. Um, so we went back and just changed that to let everybody just stay on one side of the road. Um, and um, so I'm, you know, uh, the number of tickets we've handed out has diminished. Um, and so I think um, we're in good shape for next week when we're going to actually start issuing um, real citations to people. Um, and we'll see where we get. And um, it will help tremendously if we start to get some um, snow actually falling and, <laughs> and we can start plowing. And then I think people will understand the whole rationale for this. So um, I, I've been very um, happy with the outcome that we've had and, and to see people accommodating um, the situation. Thank you for that thorough impromptu report. <laughs> I appreciate it. That was super helpful. Um, my, my only last thing, I just like once again, I mean, it's been such a hard year and I'm just so continually impressed with the dedication of our staff and all the department heads coming together, putting together a really tough budget, everyone figuring out how to pitch in across departments and making it work and the like amazing, positive, upbeat attitudes everyone's like bring into the, the team every day and it just huge kudos to the staff and to the management and just keeping our city on course during incredibly challenging times. So just appreciation to everyone. Yes, agreed. Um, all right. Uh, so I just have a couple of things. Um, so one is uh, the Energy Committee received a number of uh, responses to their RFP to put together a net zero um, uh, 2030 plan uh, for the city and they'll be reviewing those RFPs tomorrow so hopefully they will be coming out of that with some uh, suggestions um, and I think actually that might be uh, the only update I, I have for now so I'm gonna with that, I'm going to pass it off to John. All good here. Got nothing. Okay. Uh, Bill. 
Just quickly, um, I, I thought this was going to go in the weekly report, but it didn't. So I'm going to embarrass the chief, and I might need his help here, police chief. Um, you may recall one of the things that we talked about as being a, a high priority for our department was this uh, crisis intervention training, CIT. And the chief's been a big advocate for it in his former position and coming here. And there's been a national board being formed to sort of look at best practices, and our chief got named to it as one of the members wow. of the process. Oh my gosh. Uh, and so maybe you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, I appreciate it, sir. Um, it's so it's basically um, it's, it's CIT International. CIT stands for Crisis Intervention Team. Uh, currently, I don't think there's a CIT program in. Um, we don't have a program in the state of Vermont. We do have a handful of officers. Uh, trained. I think there's one agency that's doing it, but uh, it's CIT International. That the job or, or the uh, the goal of the organization is to spread and to advocate pretty much for mental health and 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 de-escalation and how we uh, as first responders uh, work in these these types of uh, crisis situations. So uh, it, it's going to be great. I think it's a three-year term and it's a working board member. So uh, I'm hoping to to build a lot of bridges, uh, develop a lot of relationships and seeing what resources we can bring back to not only the city, but uh, the state as a whole. So I was very honored and blessed to be part of it. So it was an application and selection process. So we're very happy that our little part of the world and our great chief got, got picked. So that's my report for the week. They, I told the police to put it in the weekly report and it didn't make it. So they don't brag that way, I'll brag on you, so. Well, congratulations, uh, that is phenomenal. Um, so that's all I have. So oh, great. Um, all right. Well, uh, I think that is it. And at least it's not as late as last time. Uh, so I'll, I'll take it. And um, have a happy holidays, everybody. I'll see you in January. With that, good. without objection, I'll consider the meeting adjourned. This is too long between meetings. Maybe we should can get get another one. <laughs> <laughs> Probably will. Just for fun. <laughs> See you next year. Right. See you. Bye. Good night. Have a good night. Yeah.